Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Allard. I'm City Councilor for San Boniface. I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Councilor Debbie Sharma, Councilor Marcus Chambers, and uh, by remote, uh, Councilor Browati. Um, I'd first like to recognize that we are on Treaty 1 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. J'aimerais premièrement reconnaître que nous nous trouvons sur le territoire visé par le traité numéro 1 et la terre traditionnelle de la Nation Métis. Uh, with that, um, I wonder if I can pass the chair to a volunteer who's in the chamber who can see everything. Council Chambers volunteers. Uh, and so, Council Chamber, with you in the chair, I move adoption of the minutes of the last meeting. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Okay. Up to you, Ms. Uh, Council Chambers. Okay. We're looking at our first item. Uh, an appeal variance at 100 Cole Avenue, DAV 197684A slash 2020C. So public service have a, uh, a report on this. Sorry? Oh, okay. In accordance with the City of Winnipeg Charter and the Development Procedures Bylaw, the process the committee will follow is the appellant will be heard first, followed by those in support of the appeal. Next, those registered in opposition are heard, followed by those registered for information. Finally, the appellant may return to speak in rebuttal to comments made. However, no new information is permitted. Please note that when your name is called, it is your opportunity to speak. However, you are not obligated to do so. For a more in-depth overview of the public hearing process and other information pertaining to what happens before, during, and after a public hearing, please consult the public hearing process brochure, which is available on the City Clerk's Department website. Please note that all public hearings are recorded and will be part of the public record. Should you have any questions after the hearings have concluded, please contact the City Clerk's Department. Item number one is an appeal against the decision of the Director of Planning, Property and Development to reject a variance for 100 Cole Avenue under file DAV 197684A slash 2020C. Uh, on February 17th, 2021, the appellant withdrew the appeal and as such, the item was filed. So moving on to item two. Item two is an appeal against the decision of the Director of Planning, Property and Development to reject a variance for Keniston Boulevard, south side of Statutory Railway Roadway, south of Taylor Avenue, under file DAV 219892A slash 2020C. Members of committee, please note additional communications were received in support of the appeal, which have been distributed to all members of the committee. All participants have been muted and will only be permitted to speak when called upon. Once you have been heard, you can either remain in the Zoom meeting or leave and continue to watch live via the city's YouTube channel. If any participants are currently watching the live meeting on YouTube, please mute your audio player now. Summer from the administration. Good morning, councillors. Um, on that DAV 2219892, the applicant intends to erect a digital static copy billboard in the, on a property zone M2. In the M2 zoning district, the maximum of uh, Billboard height is 30 feet, and the maximum so uh, size surface area is 200 square feet. However, the applicant is requesting variance for a sign, or a billboard sign that is 48 tall uh, sign, which is a 60% increase in height, and a sign surface area of 672 square footage in size, which is three times what is allowed. Um, the Urban Planning Division, having reviewed uh, the applicant's uh, proposal uh, therefore rejected the variance. Uh, it is equally of note that these variances are not or cannot be said to be the minimum modification to the zoning bylaw as per section of 2473 of the Winnipeg Charter. Thank you. Okay, uh, we can move to the appellant now. So first we have Jeff Pynchon. Morning, Jeff, you're now live with the committee. You'll have 10 minutes after you state your name. Thank you, good, good morning. My name is Jeff Pynchon. I'm at 100-1 Portage Avenue East. And I'm, I'm obviously here in support of the appeal and, and also the applicant. Um, it's good to, good to see everybody again, uh, only two weeks out uh, with, with another application. I was very happy that we were able to work with the administration on, on the first one. Uh, and this, this application has some, some similarities where we have done the math and science once again to 
to prove the need for the height and the size variances uh, that are required to make the sign scaled appropriate for the property and actually, you know, safely able to to uh, to be used. The uh, uh, planning property and, and development director has already approved the conditional use, so they've already approved the idea of having a back-to-back -back sign at this location. And I just believe that there was some misunderstanding uh, on the math and science that we provided, showing why the height and size variances were were being requested. Um, as these height and size variances have been requested and granted um, many times throughout the city in the last couple of years, uh, even sometimes with the support of, of the planning property uh, uh, department, um, because scaling a sign appropriately when with a bridge or an underpass or a setback makes the sign appear to be the proper, si uh, the proper size uh, to the motorist and the traffic for a safe distance and a safe viewable area uh, instead of scaling it to a smaller size just to fit a bylaw that then makes it more like a, a blinking dot and something that you're squinting and looking at as, as you're driving and, and possibly making it not as safe as it can be. So that that is why we, we've done some math and, and science here that I'd like to prove or show with you. If I could show my screen here. The, the project that we were discussing, uh, where we're proposing to install this back-to-back -back billboard is at the CN Rail underpass along Keniston, south of Taylor. Hopefully you can see the screen here. Um, as you can see, we're near the pump house there on the right side of that picture. This would be Keniston driving north. And because of a giant elevation difference between where even the top of the ground uh, of the hill at the end of Wilkes to where Keniston is, uh, as well as a extremely large setback. Generally, we build within a foot of, of a roadway. Uh, this this is this is mul multiple feet back, as you can see from the pictures here. Um, and that is the request for both the height and the size. Um, if you can see on the other side, the only way that you can see uh, through the bridge for the back side of the sign would would be once again with, with that height. So the height is is being requested and the size to reduce the injurious effect really caused by the bridge on this M2 zone property, uh, which might I add, the idea of, of having this sign has already been approved. The, the other way to do it would be to build two signs, one on, on either side, um, and that's really not the intent of, of the bylaw. So these variances would actually reduce the overall amount of signs. Um, making it more more efficient for, I believe, everybody involved. Uh, so in, in our respectful opinion, I will go on to show the site survey that we've had professionally conducted as a line of sight with Barnes and Duncan. This is proving the elevations. As you can see, the proposed height here shows that it needs to be 47.9 feet or 48 feet. Um, to be viewed safely and appropriately from both sides. As you can see, the different pictures here are from different roadway heights going both north and south, uh, as well as the line of sight to that, to where the sign becomes appropriate to, to see, uh, in junction with that, that pump house on the, obviously on the south side, and the, the concrete underpass, or underpass slash overpass of the rail tracks um, on, on the north there. So it, it is our respectful opinion the variance is required to propose this billboard are consistent with plan Winnipeg and any applicable secondary plan in that the subject property does not lie adjacent to a regional or mixed community mixed use corridor defined by the complete community strategies in our Winnipeg. This proposal would represent a higher quality development, especially when compared to other sciences within the city, commercial and industrial uses in the immediate area, therefore improving the quality of the Keniston streetscape and furthering the intent of our Winnipeg. Our signs are now considered a, an essential service and have been used in many cases over many years from Amber Alerts to even current messages in the pandemic. And in such a commercial zone, we would also be an amenity to the nearby uh, neighboring community. We also believe that this does not create a substantial adverse effect on the amenities, use, safety, and convenience of the adjoining property uh, an adjoining area, including any area separated from the property by a street or waterway, in that the billboard would be angled only towards Keniston Boulevard traffic. 
It would not be angled towards any residential uses and would have no impact on such uses as shown in this lighting survey. I'll bring that up here. Once again, we have done the math and science to prove that the lighting area is funneled both on the north and the south only to Keniston. Uh, we even took further steps to wait to file this application until the Capion plan had been completely filed uh, last October. As you can see with the red X where, where our sign is located, uh, the plan on adjacent to us is nothing but commercial. There is no residential uh, within hundreds of meters of, of this location and the rail tracks. So we've, we've even gone one step further to look for future plans. Uh, although these permits are voted or re-approved re every, every eight years, by the time this development is, is starting to take hold, uh, this permit will come up again, but we want to be ready for the future. So to continue on here, this billboard is also operates at all the city of Winnipeg uh, billboard standards for 0.3 foot candles above ambient lighting, utilizes automatic dimming technology, has the six second hold time, no use of an animation, transitional effects or message sequencing, um, and, and is operated in, in all the manners of brightness uh, that the city of Winnipeg uh, allows. Um, and lastly, this is a, a minimum modification of the zoning bylaw required to leave the injurious effect of the zoning bylaw on the applicant's property in that the underpass and the elevation uh, of the ground around as well as the setback of the property due to the lower elevation of the roadway require these two variances. Like I mentioned, the idea of having the back-to-back -back sign has already been agreed and, and approved to. I just think that some of this math and science, this line of sight, specifically the lighting diagram that I showed earlier, um, between the pandemic and files going back and forth and, and, and this file being shifted between between members of, of the planning district, maybe, maybe it just wasn't seen um, or, or, or uh, there was something missed, but I believe that, that we have have the information that, that proved that this is a minimum modification. Um, on, on top of that, a larger size and, and height variances have been approved even, even recently for the same reasons of scaling the sign appropriately for, this, for the property. Having a sign that is at 30 feet, um, once again, puts it off to the side further out of your viewing angle. Um, and, and therefore is, is then taking your head off the roadway. And, and we believe safety is of, always of utmost importance and follow many standards. And this, this would be one of them. Uh, for for some, some past, past information, the city has approved even eight of these signs of the exact same size uh, and with heights sometimes double, as much as double as this request, um, even as recently as, as one Cole Avenue on the Naren Bridge uh, with a sign of the exact same size and a height of, of 85 feet, where we're only requesting 48 today. And it was once again agreed, even with part of the planning administration, that the height and size were required in a variance because it appropriately scales the sign for the roadway. If this was a normal intersection uh, or a normal roadway where we were not set back uh, a great, great distance from the road, uh, as, as well as with an elevation aspect, uh, we would not be requiring these variances and, and we wouldn't unfortunately even be here today. Uh, but, but for those reasons, uh, we believe that, that we, are, we are compatible in the area in which this property is situated as it is a large M2 property with a heavy industrial focus being CN rail freight. The immediate surrounding area is filled with many of Winnipeg's largest and most commercialized auto intense destinations, including the IKEA, the new seasons of Tuxedo Outlet Mall, Maxim Truck and Trailer, Custom Transport, GFL Environmental, multiple new car dealerships, commercial and industrial offices, uh, the new com commercial components and development of Capion Barracks. Um, and this would actually fit into the area quite well in what is a highly commercialized area. Um, beyond that, I would just like to state that our sign won't even be a third of as tall or as big as the IKEA. Hold on a sec. Um, you've reached your 10 minute allotment. Uh, do we have a motion to, uh, how much more time would you need just to- uh, one, one, one sentence. 
Okay, all right, uh, so, go ahead. So sorry for running over, but I was just gonna say for, for, for all these reasons, we respectfully believe that our request for this variant should be improved, approved in conjunction with the conditional uses already approved by the Director of Planning, Property and Development for this location. Okay. So we can complete our proposal. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions of my council colleagues? Uh, well, I wanna know what happens if we go with the, um of the default uh, urban planning division recommendation. Then to my understanding, uh, the sign would be approved at 30 feet in height um, and at the, the 200 square foot size allowed. Uh, but now the sign is going to be set back. If I can bring up the other diagram. it gets set back on the south side here or on the, the driving south side over to this side and a lot smaller. And as you can see, it's now taking your attention away from the roadway. Um, the whole reason for this height and size is really for safety. Having your, your attention drawn further off the roadway is never the intent of the sign. It is to continue driving and to see it without removing your eyes from the roadway. So that, that is why these variances are, are requested so that it can be seen in the way that normal billboards are seen. I actually have the opposite belief. I believe that if there are things that are near the road, people uh, become more aware and become more careful about their surroundings, but we'll have to, I guess, respectfully disagree on that. Um, I'm, uh, I'm reading the part about the built, the urban built form and the, the current and future built form. Those are always considerations that I, uh, that I find important. What is your response to that? Um, as far as the future plans for, for Capion and the area? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously, this is not the type of sign that I met that lends itself well to, you know, walkable community, given the fact that it's, uh, it's so high. It's obviously it's, uh, it's designed for automobiles to see it. So I always, uh, I always like to ask questions on, along those lines. Sure. It, it, because of the elevation, if you notice, it's actually in the valley. So it won't appear high to anything surrounding it, except for when you're driving. So as you're going down into the valley, that's when you're going to see it. So th that, that's why I believe that the height is compatible with the exact characteristics of the ground. The right. I guess, area I guess I'm wondering about your comments about the future development i mean sure. today okay but i mean what about tomorrow oh no and, and have that big sign there and um there's a more urban form happening uh developing around it well we did specifically wait until the capcom plans were filed which then did show a commercial use uh directly north of the underpass between taylor and the underpass directly on both sides of keniston so we would be surrounded by commercial and industrial use lands on all sides of this project. That was something important because uh, I don't believe that, that signs should be in residential areas or, or viewable from residential areas. That's not is what, that, what we're Is that about. a sidewalk I see on the um, uh, on, on your picture there? Is there a sidewalk adjacent yes. to the highway? Okay. Yes, almost almost all all of these are areas will will be have adjacent sidewalks. Okay, those are the those are the that's the end of my questions. Okay, I was going to answer about the future development as well. If I if I could add one point that sure. this this a billboard would have to be reapproved every eight years under the how the bylaw works, so that if it was deemed that there were better uses for the area and this was no longer appropriate, um, then it just wouldn't be approved again. And it would be removed. This is not a forever decision. Yeah, I also understand it's difficult to remove things that are already existing, but uh, that's my understanding. It's not really a question. I'm I'm done with questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Allard. Uh, I have a question. Uh, as a comparator, how does this sign size and height uh, compare with the uh, IKEA sign that is directly southwest of it? Um, we are much smaller. Uh, the IKEA sign has a total height of 116 feet. So we're, we're al almost a third, a little roughly, roughly more than that, but roughly a third of that height. Um, the sign faces, we are, we are one back-to-back -back sign where I don't have the exact measurements of their face, but I believe their face is, is roughly double to triple the size of our face. 
of our side. So it, it is considerably a much, much, the IKEA sign is considerably a much, much larger sign than what we are uh, proposing today. Okay. We, we are much uh, closer to the signage for the season of tuxedo that is uh, outlet mall. We are, we are similar to that and, and still a little bit smaller as they have signs on every corner. And I do see uh, the plans that you have for the Capion Barracks where the positioning of your sign is adjacent to commercial mixed use property, but just to the west of it, directly to the west of it and directly to the north of it, there is residential mild density or mid density uh, uh, areas uh, that are being anticipated or planned for that area. Just uh, one would be directly west across Keniston and the other one directly north, just past Taylor. Uh, in terms of light pollution, uh, would it spread to those areas if the commercial buildings were say single stories, even double stories? Uh, well, luckily we, we did the math and science on that and, and got a lighting diagram. And as you can see here, if, if the lighting stays within this 50 band, which is under worst case scenario, so not no moon, no commercial buildings, no traffic lights, the light doesn't even extend really much into those commercial properties. The, the residential mixed use that you're, you're discussing ends up being hundreds of, of meters away from this uh, and wouldn't even be able to see the sign, let alone any light from it. Their, their own street lights would, would appear to be brighter. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> any other questions? Seeing none. Next speaker we have is Charles Chappell speaking in support of the appeal. Yeah, go ahead if you're ready. Or we're letting them in. Just needs to. Chuck, if you could just unmute yourself. I need, okay. Can you hear me now, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, my name's Charles Chapel of 401 180 Tuxedo Avenue. I'm legal counsel to Patterson Outdoor Advertising. I don't have a great deal to add to the um, comments made by Mr. Pynchon, uh, except for this. I had a discussion with the ward councillor on both Friday last and um, uh, Tuesday last um, relating to this application and the appeal. And councillor Klein was concerned initially with the uh, impact it may have on um, the Capyong Barracks development uh, immediately to the north on both sides of Caniston. The lighting diagram we've produced shows, uh, I think conclusively, that there will be no negative impact on that development from the sign if approved. The second point I would like to make is I believe Mr. Pynchon in his submission has uh, confirmed that the criteria necessary to uh, grant a variation have been met. And um, therefore I would accordingly request that the uh, uh, appeal be granted and the variation approved. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, subject to any questions. Okay, are there any questions of my council colleagues? Seeing none. We have no one else registered in support and we have no one registered in opposition or for information. Okay. So we can ask questions of the public service at this time. So we go back to the public service. Uh, are there any questions of the public service in terms of what? Go ahead, uh, Councillor Bawadi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, questions here for Femi. Um, looking at the Capiong plans, I mean, we know that there's a concept plan. We know that there's still probably there, there may still be some change to that plan. But can you confirm that the current version of the plan would have both sides of Keniston sort of um, between um, uh, the railway tracks, the, the right of way and Taylor, that the area entirely surrounding it to the north of the sign would be commercial use? Uh, 
I just can't hear you, Femi. Yeah, I just want to start by saying that uh, the intent of the zoning bylaw is to ensure that science uh, aligns better with uh, their surroundings. And uh, from, from what we have currently, the existing uh, plans for Capion Barracks, uh, to the north where you referenced is, uh, is, uh, is for misuse development. And you can see we have commercial and some residential uses. And uh, that, that is why uh, one of the reasons why we rejected the variance. And aside from that, um, like uh, Mr. Jeff referenced, uh, there are some other uh, applications in the past where uh, they've asked for this type of variances. But I want to say that some of those variances are actually being rejected but we are approved by Board of Adjustment, not uh, the appeal committee. Okay. And would you say that when you're de de designing a, a community, um, do you normally put residential uses up against a railway track or do you try to move that as far away as possible from a, a busy 24 hour uh, main railway track? Um, there are no specific, um, th there are guidelines which want to put the residential or very close to a rail track. If a developer is willing to meet some of these uh, mitigations, or it is allowed, it's, there's nothing stopping them from doing that. Okay, but under even like what we're likely going to approve in terms of the uh, the FCM Railway, Railway, Railway Association of Canada guidelines, um, is there supposed to be some separation between types of use and uh, railway tracks? So if a developer is, uh, is developing a residential just along the tracks, uh, he will need to either provide a crash wall or a berm or uh, landscaping or a combination of all of these. And if these uh, standards are met, then uh, you can't stop them from doing that. Right. Um, and even in terms of residential development, would you try to put it in the more closer to the um, other types of residential to the in particular west or would you want to put it closer to a major roadway with tens of thousands of vehicles going down it including large semi trailers 24 hours a day you know going in and out of center port and connecting to the south uh, i'm sure that would be the preference for in terms of uh, planning uh, standards but uh, if like you know this is more like uh, uh, a private uh, development so Right. If, if they're willing to meet some all these standards from FCM guidelines regarding their proximity or rail lines, I don't think anybody can stop them from doing that. Femi, what's the current traffic counts on Keniston? Sorry? What are the current traffic counts on, on Keniston Boulevard? Um, I can't really speak to that, but I'm sure it's, it's really busy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other questions of uh, public administration? I do have a question with respect to traffic as well. Um, in term, and just help me out here. Uh, you know, the the uh, the gentleman there uh, talked about traffic and 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 sight lines and and eyes darting away from the roadway to the sign, and 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 that uh, perspective. But uh, when I talked about the IKEA sign that's the substantively higher and larger. Um, is there any consistency between uh, why that was approved and why this might not be approved or, you, or the public administration's uh, opposition to it uh, from the perspective of, of uh, those same concerns related to traffic and sight lines and, and eyes darting away from, uh, from the roadway? Uh, first, I just want to uh, distinguish between this type of sign. This is a billboard sign, while the other one is more like a freestanding identification sign for I care. Mm -hmm. But this is a billboard for like third party advertisement of things like that. So I want to I want to get back to uh, figure three on the on my report there, page ten. Uh, he, the applicant mentioned the fact that in terms of sideline and everything, but if you look at this uh, this particular elevation. This sign is on the highest point of the elevation before the uh, underpass. And the, what you discover is even at 30 feet, because it's on the highest point of the elevation, it will be seen from both sides of Kenaston. I'm very, I'm pretty sure of that. And I, I guess uh, it, it, it goes back to your point you made earlier on in terms of where this is at. So we take into consideration, I, I went back to look at the one on one Fall Street in which uh, we had supported a much higher height. Uh, the relationship between the sign and the, the roadway on, on that one is, is different from this. 
this sign is on the highest point on the elevation on the, on the road burn and on the highest point. So even at 30 feet, and there are 200 square foot it will be seen on both sides of your canal screen. I believe that. Okay, so I don't know if you've answered my question. Uh, and I, I recognize the difference between it being a billboard or uh, as opposed to a identification, but ultimately they're, they're serving the same purpose. They're providing information. Mm -hmm. So whereas one is a little bit higher, well, higher and larger that uh, is approved, um, what is the difference between that and something that is smaller and, and lower, uh, but essentially providing the same service in terms of information? Um, I, I, to be honest, I wouldn't know well, what happened or why the other one was approved, but I'm sure sometimes well, we look at the scale of the development or maybe that will have factored into why uh, the one for I care was approved. Uh, I don't know, but I'm sure uh, since then, uh, the zoning bylaw has been uh, tweaked to make sure that the science aligns better with their, their surrounding context. Thank you. Any other questions of our public administration? Seeing none. Okay, Jeff, you can now speak in rebuttal to any comments made, just know no information is permitted. Well, I, I, I'm most, mostly here for questions. I, I believe that the point I wanted to make is, Timmy even mentioned that in the past, we've allowed signs, including the IKEA sign, to be scaled correctly for the pre piece of development or the, the proper land use. And it's, it's no different here. Um, one, one of the ones for height that was supported by the planning and property uh, division was this, this application at one coal, where the size of the sign was the same, and they agreed with us because of the line of sight survey that we provided, similar to the one today, that the height should be 85 feet on the sign. And we're only asking for 48 today. Yes, we are at, uh, at a midway part of the berm, but that's for engineering reasons. Um, engineering reasons because of the slant of the hill and where there's actually solid ground use. Um, you can't just stick it in anywhere and, and there's not always places that we can have a crane back in from, from Wilkes there. So we've actually invested a lot of resources making sure that we have the exact appropriate location uh, for engineering standards, sight lines, like I said, the lighting, lighting spread or, or, or lighting diagram would be appropriately used. Um, so I, I'm mostly here for questions, but, but I believe that with all the information we provided and with all the past cases that we've been approved of and other uses like the IKEA sign, that is much larger than what we're asking for today, that we are consistent with the area, uh, especially with the, the upcoming plans, plans for Capion. Any questions of my colleagues? Seeing none. Do we have a, are we ready for a motion? Or I'd is, be ready for a motion. Is it, Maybe I can confer with my colleagues before making it or I'll make a motion. Please proceed. Yeah, okay. Um, I move that the port of the Winnipeg Public Service be taken as read. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, carried. I move that the receipt of public representations be concluded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move Opposed, that in court. Carried. I move that in accordance with subsection 247.3 of the City of Winnipeg Charter, the variance is not consistent with Plan Winnipeg and any applicable secondary plan does not create a substantial adverse effect on the amenities Sorry. use. Sorry, it does create um, a substantial adverse effect on the amenities use, safety and convenience of the adjoining property and adjacent area, including an area separated from the property by a street or waterway. Uh, is not the minimum modification of a zoning bylaw required to relieve the injurious effects of the zoning bylaw on the applicant's property and is not compatible with the area in which the property to be affected is situated. In terms of supporting comments, um, I um, um, I guess in, in terms of my questions to the, to the delegate, I asked about uh, things like uh, walkability and urban form. You can see there, there's a, there's a sidewalk beside the highway and um, you can see that the sign is clearly auto focused and not focused to making a more urban walkable environment. And I think in the future, as referenced in the report, um, it's going to be more important to have 
to have a walkable uh, community and and the way that we put up our signage is is part of that and as uh, you know as part of our strategy to encourage people to get out of cars and and um, uh, use other modes of transportation every little bit counts and uh, I think our urban form if, if we make it amenable and interesting for for pedestrians I think we're going to have more of that so um, I, I'd like to support the planning department uh, in their um, in their uh, position. I would actually be willing to um, not just kill this uh, application, but revert it back to the the planning department recommendations, so the applicant uh, would have uh, authority for a sign, but the sign uh, re recommended by the planning department, not the sign that we're applying for today. But anyway, those are my supporting comments, and uh, I added those other points uh, in terms of this discussion or other motions. Are there any others? Go ahead, Councillor Barawati. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will not be supportive of uh, Councillor Allard's motion. This is an example where I think this is the reason we have these processes and why variances are allowed. Um, you know, best planning practices, if we're in a very urban, uh, suburban, walkable area, even in a, in, a, in a neighborhood, this would not be appropriate. But we are talking about a billboard, a digital billboard, going up against a major railway track. We're talking about a digital billboard on a major trade corridor with, you know, thousands and thousands of vehicle movements every day. Plus, it's also the gateway to new communities in South Winnipeg. Uh, providing the opportunity for businesses to promote themselves through digital billboards is important. Uh, the, the arrangements with Patterson to allow for City of Winnipeg messaging on signs is also important. Um, again, I think the height is reasonable, and uh, that's because that they are doing the signs so that when you're traveling northbound, you're able to see it uh, from the other side of the bridge structure. Um, I don't believe that it is um, uh, distracting the way that they're proposing to do it. Uh, and I think it is, it, it is in fact appropriate. Uh, so for those reasons, uh, I am not supportive of Councillor Allard's motion and I am supportive of, uh, of granting the variance. Any other supporting comments? I just have a question for clarification, if I if I may, Mr. Chair. Is there a time limit, Madam Clerk? Uh, there was some reference made to a time limit earlier. I just would like clarification on that, unless I misheard. Could oh, provide. I don't see any conditions um, listed in the report, but that's because it could be uh, a recommendation to reject. If I may, Mr. Chair, if I could just ask sure. the planner sure. to add to that. Yeah, typically, uh, because we're rejecting the variance, so there's no condition on that, but on, on the conditional use, which was approved, um, is automatic, it's eight years for, for lifespan of, of, of the conditional use application for the boards. Eight years. Mm -hmm. After that, we need to come back and reapply. Yeah, I think it, that was referenced earlier. I think yeah, I'd have to come back and apply as if it was a new application in eight years. In eight years. And that it, that it would make sure that it fit the surrounding area then. Okay, thank you. So, so sorry, go ahead. So this will be coming back in eight years, sorry, Madam Clerk, regardless of the decision made. That's right, eight years is the timeline. Yeah, it's timeline, yeah. Okay, are we ready to call the question? All in favor of Councillor Allard's motion? Nay. 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 Okay. Uh, continue on, I guess. Councillor, I'll move a new motion. Or, Mr. Chairman, can I, can I move a new motion? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor uh, Barwadi, please. I move that in accordance with subsection 2473 of the City of Winnipeg Charter, the variance A is consistent with Plan Winnipeg and any applicable secondary plan B does not create a substantial adverse effect on the amenities, use, safety, and convenience of the adjoining property and adjacent area, including an area separated from the property by a street or waterway. C is the minimum modification of a zoning bylaw required to relieve the injurious effect of the zoning bylaw on the applicant's property. And D is compatible with the area in which the property to be affected is situated. My supporting comments are, uh, Keniston Boulevard is a major uh, arterial roadway, a uh, trade corridor. Um, the proposed location for the sign is uh, immediately, in fact, on uh, a major railway corridor. Uh, the height and location of the sign is such that it should not be visible from any residential property. 
and appears to be compatible with the um, planning documents for the Capillon Barracks redevelopment. Uh, any other supporting comments? Uh, I want to add as well that uh, in I, I asked questions specifically with regards to the signs that are also adjacent on uh, Keniston Boulevard in that context in that area, and they seem to be uh, you know some of them seem to be higher, bigger, larger, uh, or consistent with what's being proposed here by uh, Patterson Signs. Uh, as well, uh, they've taken into consideration the future plans of the Capion Barracks and have provided, uh, you know, supportive information with respect to uh, not only why they want the sign to be seen on both sides, but have taken into consideration the context of the development that is forthcoming and uh, have assured that uh, it will not per uh, present any problems with respect to light pollution or light scatter. So uh, I'm supportive of it that way as well. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, continue on. Uh, I move that the appeal uh, be allowed and order DAV 219-892-2020C be canceled. And all then I'd like to be recorded in opposition for, for all those motions. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Continue. Uh, okay. So that was carried. Uh, and I move that uh, the decision of the Director of Planning, Property, and Development not be concurred in. All in favor? Aye. Nay. Aye. Opposed? Carried. And I move that the public hearing with respect to this appeal be concluded. All in favor? Aye. Nay. Oh, yes. Opposed? I'll vote yes for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item number three. Oh. Item number three is an appeal against the decision of the Director of Planning, Property and Development to approve a variance for 479 Elgin Avenue under file DAV 222152A slash 2020C. All participants have been muted and will only be permitted to speak when called upon. Once you have been heard, you can either remain in the Zoom meeting or leave and continue to watch live via the city's YouTube channel. If any participants are currently watching the live meeting on YouTube, please mute your audio player now. Somebody from administration? Yes, of course. <clears throat> uh, so, Councillor, this is a property in the uh, Centennial neighborhood of the Point, Point Douglas Ward. Uh, hey, uh, could I just ask the volume? <clears throat> Uh, so this is a property in the Centennial neighborhood uh, of the Point Douglas Ward. Uh, it's located at 479 Elgin Avenue. It's just east of Elgin and Isabel. If you're familiar with the Rondex Auto Body Shop, it's the property right next to the Rondex store. Uh, the property is zoned CMU, commercial mixed use, uh, although the previous building that was on the site, uh, which was constructed in 1892, uh, was a duplex. Um, our understanding is the duplex suffered a, uh, a fire in July of 2020, uh, and I believe is, is, has been demolished or will be demolished soon. Uh, and the owner is proposing to replace um, that previous structure with a new infill dwelling that would contain three unit, four units and three parking stalls. Um, as mentioned, it's zone CMU and due to that, uh, it's required to meet the dimensional standards for side yards under the CMU district, which are uh, six or sorry, 12 feet on each side. It is a relatively small property, despite it being zoned for commercial uses, it's only 37 feet wide. Uh, and the applicant is proposing a, a dwelling that would be, or a building that would be 24 feet wide with six and a half foot side yards on either side. Um, the uh, parking would be located off the back lane, three parking stalls. There'd be space for garbage and cycling and, and a bike rack. Um, and there is also a secondary plan for the neighborhood. Under the secondary plan, this property is designated uh, residential uh, medium density policy area. So although it's zoned CMU under the plan, it's designated residential. So there's this somewhat of an imbalance between what the zoning and what the secondary plan allows. Um, all of that to say, uh, there is a hardship being created uh, by the zoning bylaw due to the fact that it's zoned CMU, it's very small. Um, we would evaluate it more as a residential uh, infill dwelling. Those typically have four foot side yards. In this case, they're providing six and a half. Um, again, due to its designation under the secondary plan, there's also a height limitation of 35 feet. Although a commercial building with this zoning typically can go up to 60 feet, the secondary plan PDO limits it to 35 feet. So they're requesting a modification for that. And of course, they're requesting a, a variance to parking. Uh, for four units, they would be required to provide five parking stalls. They're providing three. We're supported. It's uh, in an area with 
convenient access to transit as well as uh, regular amenities to support the day-to-day -day needs of residents. Um, we are recommending as a condition of approval, plan approval through the Director of Planning, Property and Development. And that's just to take a second look at the, the final design drawings uh, and make sure that the whatever is built on the site in the future is compatible with, with the surrounding context. Okay. Uh, can move to the appellant now. Okay, so first we have Peggy Zong. Hi, Peggy, you're now live at the committee. You'll have up to 10 minutes after you state your name. Hi, my name is uh, Peggy. I'm the next neighbor of 479 Elgin. Uh, I mean, this is really old community and I'm glad they have the demolished because the, the fire and now they got a new chance to build a new building. And, um, but my house is still like a hundred years old. I know the new house have the new code, have the fire fire code to prevent a more secure. But um, I mean, this is older community needs more like street and more cautions on the regulations because um, the older house has much more risks from the material of house and neighborhoods. And also the crime is, and also um, the fire accident rates in, uh, in this neighborhood is really high. So, I mean, if we have the chance to prevent this, prevent this, I mean, it's a good opportunity to reconsider it, like follow the new route. That's why the new regulations uh, have 12 feet between house and house. So uh, I would really uh, appreciate it that the government can really think about the new regulations. And uh, I mean, that's the minimal we can do to reduce the, the rate of the fires. And um, also because I have a baby in my house and uh, last time the fire is two minutes, almost like fried up my house. So if the new building have the so close, I'm really concerning about the safety of our house and our baby and ourselves as well. Yep, this is all my concern. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Uh, seeing none. Okay, we have no one else registered in support of the appeal. So we can move on to the applicant, Paul Singh. Okay. Hi, Paul, you're now live with the committee. You'll have 10 minutes for your presentation after you state your name. Just have to unmute yourself, Paul. Unmute. Sorry, no, it's fine. So yeah, uh, this is Paul Singh uh, from Sure Homes. Um, uh, Peggy's just uh, uh, concern is just because this building is too too close. Uh, in infill house that we can even leave four feet from the uh, adjacent property, but we are leaving already six and a half feet from the adjacent property. And then this the new building will be under the code, and then uh, exterior wall will be like a, a, a fire rated. Uh, and then the the house, the existing house, was already demolished. And then that building was too close to the uh, to the adjacent property. I think there was not more than four feet, uh, uh, like a difference between the properties. And then that building is already demolished. And then we are building a new uh, build uh, with the uh, with the current code. That's all for me. Okay. Any questions of the appellant? Seeing none. We have no one else registered in opposition and no one registered for information. If there's any uh, the public administration, any questions, any further comments? I have a question, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Harry, you mentioned there is a condition for plan approval to go to the director. Uh, there's a, also a possibility this committee could ask for plan approval to come to the Lord Selkirk West Caledonian Community Committee, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, uh, now, look, go ahead. 
Okay, we'll go back to the appellant. Uh, so Peggy, you can now speak in rebuttal to any comments made, just no new information is permitted. You'll have up to 10 minutes. Unmute. unmute yourself, Peggy. Okay. Yeah, I just heard saying like, um, <laughs> talking about the new building has the new code, but uh, that's for the new building, right? But my house is still like, it's still under the old code. So even though they have new code too, but my house is still like with the old material. So it's really easy to cause fire as well. So it doesn't under the new new material code. So prevent my house if there's a fire. So if it's a, a 12 feet can reduce like more opportunity to, to get my house in fire. So that's really my concern. Any questions of Ms. Zong? Seeing none. Uh, we're ready for motion. Madam Clerk, could we ask the administration just to respond to the last comment uh, about fire safety? Is that in order? Mr. Hare? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. Um, so like I said, the building that was previous on this, on this property was built in 1892, very old building, very different standards. Anything that comes through now has to meet the current Manitoba building code. And there are requirements for certain distances and, and fire rating and what have you. Um, and as mentioned, we are recommending plan approval. And with that, we can also review that east side or east side elevation, yes, uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, obviously things like building code and as they relate to fire, those are things that can't be varied. Those are non-negotiable. You have to meet code. Mm -hmm. um, but we can still take a look at other things like building massing, windows and entrances to make sure there's no other impacts in terms of privacy or, or other effects of, of the overall design of the building on the adjacent neighbor, something that we could take a look at through plan approval. But the code is the code is what the code is. You have to meet the building code. Uh, in terms of building code, does it are internal sprinkler systems are they required? I know that there was a push at one point to, um, you know, to have that included in, in building designs, especially in. I know it's in commercial properties, but uh, for something of this scale, is it is it something that's required or just recommended? Council, you have to forgive me, I'm not familiar with the building code specifics. Um, however, the plan examination uh, branch would take a look at that. And if, if sprinklers are required, then they would require those. Um, and you know, there's they might have other considerations that, that factor into whether or not sprinklers are required. But nonetheless, there is a, a branch of the city that would be reviewing that against the code to make sure that it complies. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm ready to move a motion. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, we'll just what? we'll just bring back the appellant um, to speak on any comments that the public service made. Yeah. Hi, Peggy. So you just have another opportunity to speak to any comments you heard from the public service just now. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is the old opportunity. I mean, this is a, a good opportunity to rebuild our old community because this community have a lot of fire because the houses are really old. Now we have the chance to have the new roof and new house. And um, I think we should have this chance to get it better instead like uh, instead like getting like more chance to get fired. So I want to live here like longer and I want this community to get better. So I want to, I mean, so I would say this is a, a good chance we can have, uh, we, can, we can build up the building and under the new code, so we prevent the, the chance to get fired. Yeah, that's what I concern. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Motion, I, I move that the report of the Winnipeg Public Service be taken as read. All in favor? Aye. Proposed, I move, carried. I move that the report of public representations be concluded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, carried. I move that in accordance with subsection 2473 of the City of Winnipeg Charter, the variance is consistent with Plan Winnipeg and any applicable secondary plan. It does not create a substantial adverse effect on the amenities, use, safety, and convenience of the adjoining property, 
an adjacent area, including an area separated from the property by a street or waterway. It is the minimum modification of the zoning bylaw required to relieve the injurious effect of this zoning bylaw on the applicant's property. And it is compatible with the area in which the property to be affected is situated. We did hear, hear from our planner in, in the summary and follow up questions. Uh, this is compatible with the area and it represents a moderate increase in density. And it adds nicely to the housing stock that we currently have there and will certainly enhance it. I would like to, um, Madam Clerk, have the plan approval come back to the LSWK Community Committee. And we, we can look at uh, additional items like the windows our planner mentioned, just to make sure privacy is taken care of. Uh, those are my supporting comments, um, Mr. Chair. Any other supporting comments? You know, I, I, for me, I would like to uh, just add that if there's an opportunity at the LSKW uh, committee to consider uh, a sprinkler system, uh, that that be considered as well uh, for this uh, for this property as it uh, as it's being developed. Um, I'm going to be voting against uh, this motion. I, uh, I would like to back the uh, planning department uh, on this. I think it's important to uh, uh, take uh, our uh, opportunities when, when zoning changes are to occur to ensure um, uh, code and safety are being maintained. And so I would like to vote against this motion as I, I would like to support the urban planning division's recommendations. Our, uh, my motion does support the urban planning division on uh, the motion that I put forward. I know it's sort of a confusing one, perhaps. Okay, could, could I, could I uh, have a bit of explanation on that, please? Ma Ma the motion I made uh, is to support the recommendation uh, of the director of planning property and development to approve the variance. Oh, okay, my, my apologies. I retract my statements. And uh, I guess I would flip the, uh, the logic of them to say that I do support and that this is the time to uh, make sure that we're using our building codes and um, you know for things like life safety and and other issues all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed carried mr chair i move that the appeal be denied and the order dav triple two one five two of 2020 c be confirmed as amended with the uh, plan approval coming to the lswk community committee all in favor aye Opposed, carried. I move that the decision of the Director of Planning, Property and Development be concurred in. All in favor? Aye. Opposed, carried. Move that the public hearing with respect to this appeal be concluded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed, carried. Thank you. Moving on. Item four, go ahead. Okay, item four, or just got a couple of minutes. Okay, can we take a five minute uh, environmental break? Sure. Five minutes. Can you get off of that bad boy? Back. Back. You're on. Okay, we're back live uh, with the appeals committee for uh, February 18th. Uh, next item. Item number four is an appeal against the decision of the Director of Planning, Property and Development to approve a variance for 1021 Royce Avenue and the file DAB 222576A slash 2020C. Members of committee, please note additional communications were received in support of the appeal, which have been distributed to all members of the committee. All participants have been muted and will only be permitted to speak when called upon. Once you have been heard, you can either remain in the Zoom meeting or leave and continue to watch live via the city's YouTube channel. If any participants are currently watching the live meeting on YouTube, please mute your audio player now. A summary from the administration. Go ahead. Good morning, committee. Uh, the subject property is located on the north side of Royce Avenue in the Maybank neighborhood of the River Heights, Fort Gary Ward. The site is located in, in a mature community as, de as designated in the complete communities uh, direction strategy. The property is owned R1M is 5,051 square feet in size, and is com uh, comprised of two underlying 25 foot wide lots, a 520 square foot house 
constructed in 1937 is currently located on the property. The applicant is proposing to split the existing 50 foot wide lot into two 25 foot wide lots. The existing dwelling on site will be demolished to enable the construction of a new bi-level single family dwelling. But the applicant has not submitted plans of development at this time. Future development on the site will be required to meet all the dimensional standards for the R1M district. Uh, the public service placed uh, a number of conditions, standard conditions of approval on this application to ensure that the future development is consistent with the area context. The applicant seeks one variance for lot area. The public service supports this variance because the division requires at least one example of a similar uh, lot size on the block in order to support another uh, lot of that same size. In this case, there are 11 examples of the same size lot and block. Um, the uh, Urban Planning Division is supportive of the variance application uh, because the proposed variance enables the context a sensitive subdivision of an existing lot in this mature community. And the support of the variances provide reasonable accommodation to enable infill development that is consistent and compatible with established lot sizes on this block of Royce Avenue. Thank you. Any questions of the public service? None. <clears throat> Uh, so the appellant did not register with us. We can move on to those in support. And we have Candace Schwartz. Hi, Candace. You're now live at the appeal committee. You'll have up to 10 minutes for your presentation after you state your name. Thank you. My name is Candace, and I'm at 1019 Royce Avenue. My property is directly next to the one that they're proposing the split. I am not specifically opposing the split. There are a couple of um, concessions that we would beg uh, be taken into consideration. Um, firstly, this is a neighborhood of bungalows and the city has already allowed for lot splitting and building homes that are 30 feet in height. That doesn't fit the feel of the neighborhood. Um, the particular property completely um, next to us or two door doors down from us, they already have a 30 foot home over them so allowing the lot splitting and having a 30 foot home, which was posted on the appeal sign would really make her home unappealing to live in. She would have two 30 foot homes overlooking her bungalow. Um, so we would respectfully ask that perhaps there be consideration that um, as mentioned earlier in the um, preamble that these be just a bi-level or even consider a bungalow of some sort. The other thing that we would be interested in keeping more trees. This particular property right now has 17 mature elm trees and cedars in its yard in the back. And in the front, it has one beautiful mature elm tree. By allowing the lot splitting, all 18 of these mature trees will be destroyed. Um, as we know that the root systems of the tree help with um, the water, water control, it keeps rainwater out of the sewer systems, it keeps the snow melt in the spring out of the sewer system. Um, in addition to that, um, 100 mature trees will consume, I think approximately 138, 139, um, sorry, 430 pounds of air pollutants and 53 tons of CO2 annually. Um, so removing these 17, I mean, it doesn't have a huge impact, but it does contribute to the CO2 reduction in the neighborhood overall in the city. Um, and then the other thing that we were wanting is the repairs to the infrastructure. We have had precedent on the neighborhood where, as stated before, there are 11 new 25 foot lots on our particular street. That's fine. But the infrastructure takes months, if not years, to be repaired after the construction of the new builds. The front approaches are taking, you know, two to three years to be removed. Um, any damage to the roadway, usually the, the, the current residents have to call the city numerous times 
and have the infrastructure repaired. Um, so we would like to see if there could be a stipulation on the timely repair of any infrastructure and the removing of the front driveway apron or approach, whatever you want to call it. Um, and the last thing that the neighborhood has is an issue with parking with these. I don't think that there's anything the city can do to reduce the parking issues. You know, the street is only so long, the street is only allowed parking on one side. Um, you know, splitting the lots does increase the amount of traffic down the street. Again, putting strain on the infrastructure. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, if any of the councillors or the public works has any suggestions on how to deal with the parking congestion. But um, so, like I said, I'm not imposed to the splitting of a lot. We would just like some concessions. Um, there is precedent. We know we can't fight the precedent. So we would just ask that, you know, there could be consideration for the concessions. And that's all I have at the moment. Thank you very much. Candice, is it? Thank you, Candace. Mm -hmm. are, are there any questions? Um, I, I do have a, a couple of questions, um, ma'am. Um, has the developer reached out to you and your neighbors to discuss the development plans? No, sir, nobody has contacted any of the neighbors. Okay. Um, I, I do support your concerns with respect to the trees that uh, would would be uh, exposed in terms of the, this development. And uh, that's one of the things that I, I think the the, um, the developer should be addressing through a landscaping plan. Uh, I also share your concerns with, res with respect to the repairs of the infrastructure uh, and, and doing a respectful build and making sure that, uh, you know, you as a developer, uh, make sure you meet, uh, remediate any damages that were done or, or upgrades that are necessary to make sure that the quality uh, of the street is, is, is respected, uh, you know, leaving it equal to or better than when, when you received it. Uh, the other thing about parking, I don't know if you're aware, well, you must be aware that uh, Royce would be uh, adjacent to the um, transportation corridor, the rapid transit. So, uh, you know, creating more density ar around a transit corridor like this uh, might alleviate some of those issues where people would not be de as dependent on having a vehicle uh, because they're so close uh, to an accessible rapid transportation system. Are you aware? I am aware of that, and I actually do frequently uh, use the pathways that were developed with the corridor, so I thank the city for providing the residents with that. However, the transit corridor is not a hip, hip, hip hop and a jump to this resident. It is a well over a five minute walk. And, you know, even with the current temperatures we just had, there's no way that a resident is going to walk that far. It may even be a seven minute walk as long as there's no train, because of course there is a major train track in between us and the transit corridor. So uh, selling us on the transit corridor being so close by as a solution to the parking congestion doesn't sell the neighborhood because we know that the individuals purchasing, this, purchasing these homes are not taking advantage of the transit corridor. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, next. Mr. Chair, if we can just take a brief recess, we seem to have lost the app. Reaching out to them. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll just uh, recess briefly. Minutes. Thank you. We are back uh, after our brief recess, and I think we found our appellant. Uh, I'll turn it back over to our clerks uh, to go forward. Okay, so uh, we have no one else registered in support of the appeal, so we can move on to the applicant. We have Amy Chan. Hi, Amy. You're now live with the committee. You'll have up to 10 minutes after you state your name. You just need to unmute yourself and then you can begin. Hello. 
both. Good morning. You just need to unmute yourself and then you can begin. Right, can Good morning. Begin. Okay, Tell you it. may begin. Tell it. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Amy Chance from CCY Studio. I'm the applicant for 1021's voice. And um, my client is planning to build, well, two two story houses in there, just this one, same as the. Oh. Hello? Amy, if you're watching the meeting on YouTube, can you please mute the audio player on the YouTube feed? And continue. Hi, Amy, if you can hear us, um, you can unmute yourself, but if you're watching the meeting live on YouTube, just hit pause. If you're watching the meeting on YouTube, can you please mute the audio player on the YouTube feed? Hi. Hi, Amy. Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, but if you are watching the meeting on YouTube, can you just hit pause on the YouTube feed? Oh, I did. <laughs> okay, that's it. Yes. So, can I continue or can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. Um, my client basically would like to build two two-story house, basically similar to the neighbors and across the street. So, trying to fit into the neighborhood, I believe, and. We will build them like according to quotes. So basically, we'll try to fit in the neighborhood. Um, I believe that the neighborhood is slowly to um, change a little bit. And according for the tree issues that we can, uh, if we need to remove some of the trees, we will plant them back um, after we're done our construction. And basically, that's all we're going to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions of the developer? None. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if you've had a chance to reach out to the area residents to talk and discuss the plans that you have for 1021 uh, Royce. Um, we we'll basically haven't set out the real plans there for that. Uh, because we are waiting to see if we basically can divide that uh, land into two pieces. But we will be building similar to the uh, the house, the two stories that on the left is uh, two houses down or the across to the uh, streets from uh, from the property. So I don't know if it's a bit of a chicken or an egg kind of situation, but. Uh, because the neighbors are there and have been living there for, uh, you know, a good period of time, uh, it would be worth your while. And I don't know if you value the process of meeting with neighbors to discuss potential plans and getting their support and maybe even input with respect to what uh, finally is developed on those properties if they're split. Oh, we will do that once that we have the... Uh basically the four plants nailed down and then we will be checking with the neighbors. What assurances can, what assurance can be provided that you would be committed towards a meeting with the, with the stakeholders? And when I say stakeholders, uh, that would be the area residents in defining the scope of your project. And, and like I said, seeking their input to make sure that uh, contextually what you're building fits in with the neighborhood. Yeah, we'll we'll try to settle some things therefore because before when we actually um pushed in our applications at that time it was like a COVID. <laughs> so it's hard to find anybody <laughs> to let us talk to. Well, I, I I believe that and I recognize the limitations that uh, the pandemic has had, but I still think that there are uh, opportunities through technology to, to provide that outreach and to solicit uh, the input that, again, good fences make for good neighbors, and this type of outreach will make for good neighbors as well. Uh, and I'm hoping that you would be committed towards that uh, to, to, again, seek the input that is necessary to ensure that what you're doing uh, is designed uh, to, to meet within the context of the neighborhood. Yes, we'll do. Once that we have um, some more solid um, 
plans that to now down will will be for some things that for the neighbors to see for them to agree with it. All right. Any other questions? Seeing none. We have no one else registered in opposition and no one registered for information. So you have questions to the public service. Yes. Uh, any questions to the public service? Seeing none. Okay, we'll bring back. Oh, no, sorry. Um, so then it's the uh, motion. Is anybody prepared uh, with a? I can uh, give the chair to Councillor uh, Sharma and uh, move the motion. Okay. I move that the report of the public service be taken as read. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That's I, carried. I uh, move that the receipt of the public uh, representation, no, yeah, uh, be concluded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary, that's carried. I move that in accordance with subsection 2473 of the city of Winnipeg uh, charter that the variance is uh, consistent with the plan Winnipeg and any applicable secondary plan does not create a substantial uh, adverse effect on the amenities use, safety and convenience of the adjoining property in the adjacent area, including an area separated from the property by street or waterway is a minimal modification of the zoning bylaw required to relieve the injurious effect of the zoning bylaw on the applicant's property and is compatible with the area in which the property to be affected is situated. In my supporting comments, uh, again, I would recommend, uh, strongly recommend that the, uh, the, the proponent uh, meet with the uh, area residents to discuss the plans and seek their input, uh, as well as that there is a plan uh, in terms of landscaping to address the casualties of the trees that, uh, that might be affected or would be affected in, in development. Uh, and that, um, you know, there is a plan that puts, that plants trees back or provides trees back. There are some very valid concerns that have been raised by uh, uh, Candace, I forget her last name. I would have uh, re referred to her in a more formal matter, but, um, Again, a, a landscaping plan that would address uh, replanting or reforestation of some uh, some trees to ensure that um, the concerns raised in terms of uh, land drainage, uh, as well as the, the the benefits of mature trees uh, that mature trees provide in in terms of uh, the absorption of CO two emissions and 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 such are addressed. Uh, those are my supporting comments. If there are any others. Call the question, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary, that's carried. I move that the appeal be denied and order DAV 222576-2020C be canceled, uh, confirmed. All in favor? Aye. Contrary, that's carried. I move that the decision of the Director of Planning, uh, planning Property and Development be concurred in. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary, carried. And I move that the public hearing with respect to this appeal be concluded. All in favor? Aye. Contrary, that's carried. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, moving on to the next appeal, which is number item number five, and I believe six that we can hear uh, concurrently. It is a combined hearing. Combined hearing, yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Could we just maybe have a few minutes to admit all of the- Yep, if we can recess for two minutes while we admit everybody into the waiting room. Do you need five minutes or two minutes? Yeah. Okay, we're ready to proceed with uh, 912 Jubilee. Uh, it's a combined hearing. I'll turn it over to the clerks for uh, their portion. 
Item number five is an appeal against the decision of the Director of Planning, Property and Development to approve a conditional use for 912 Jubilee Avenue under file DCU 219653A slash 2020C. In accordance with the City of Winnipeg Charter and the Development Procedures Bylaw, this is the combined hearing and the following item will also be heard at the same time, namely, Item six is an appeal against the decision of the Director of Planning, Property and Development to approve a variance for 912 Jubilee Avenue under file DAV 219656A slash 2020C. Members of committee, please note additional communications were received in support of and in opposition to the appeal, which have been distributed to all members of the committee. All participants have been muted and will only be permitted to speak when called upon. Once you have been heard, you can either remain in the Zoom meeting or leave and continue to watch live via the city's YouTube channel. If any participants are currently watching the live meeting on YouTube, please mute your audio player now. Summary from the administration. The subject properties are located on the south side of Jubilee Avenue in the Point Road neighborhood of the Port Rouge East Fork area ward. The sites are designated as being located in a mature community under the Complete Communities Direction Strategy. The properties are zoned R2, residential two-family, are approximately 7,724 square feet in size and are currently vacant. The applicant is proposing to establish an eight-unit multifamily building on each property. The proposal includes six parking spaces. The proposal also includes a car share vehicle to support both properties. A conditional use application is required to enable the multifamily development in the R2 district. A variance application is required for a building height of 38.5 feet instead of 35 feet, six parking stalls instead of 10 with the provision of a car share vehicle and buffering of parking. At the request of the Urban Planning Division, the applicant conducted neighborhood consultation, made some design improvements to their proposal and consulted with the Water and Waste Department of the City of Winnipeg. The Public Service supports the conditional use and variance for these two properties because the proposed multifamily building will be located on a block with a range of existing multifamily densities and meets all R2 zoning district standards aside from the three noted above. It also enables infill development in a mature community as envisioned in the complete community's direction strategy. I can speak further to variances as required by committee. Okay. Are there any questions of the public service by my council colleagues? Seeing none. So we'll move on to the first appellant. We have Flavia Fernandez Fabio. Good morning. You're now live with the appeal committee. You'll have up to 10 minutes after you state your name. Hi, good morning. My name is Flavia Fernandez Fabio. I, I am a resident here on Jubilee Avenue since 2011. Um, I, I was surprised when I found out about the project because Myself, I built an addition to my property, a, a 10 feet extension to the front over the 57 feet available. And I was requested to get the signatures of all the neighbors on my street, like effectively the, the signature. And I was requested that the addition was not going to, to affect the aesthetic and the character of the neighborhood. And I have never heard, I mean, we were never, from what I know from my neighbors, we were never asked uh, about this project. Like if, if we were, we were never requested to, to agree. I think that this is a residential area. Uh, this is all family houses and approving this project is opening a, a can of worms. This uh, Jubilee in a couple of years will be a tall buildings uh, street and that is not the, the character of this neighborhood. Eight units per, per lot is 16 units. So with six uh, parking spots, where is the other people going to park? Uh, because everybody will have a car. I'm, I'm mostly sure we cannot count on that. They will not have a car. On the other side, there's lots of 
really very old trees, old tall trees that because of the project, they will be, they don't, they will not have space to relocate them. So they will be directly destroyed. And it will change. Can you imagine living in a street where in your back lane you have 32 garbage bins? I mean, leaving my house in the back, I have to collect my garbage bins because collectors, they never leave it just by the house. Imagine living, living your back lane and having 32 garbage bins. Even if they put bigger, they cannot use four for 16 people. They will have to use a lot. And there's only, I think that even when I live on the other side of the street, this will affect big time the neighborhood. And again, if this gets approved, then other buildings will be approved. And I don't think that that is the, the they should respect the zoning and this project doesn't respect the, the zoning. So I was surprised to hear that this was approved without getting the consent from the neighbor. That's basically my, my one of my biggest concerns. That's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, are there any questions of um, Slavia? Uh, I have uh, just a quick question. Uh, so from what I'm hearing in your, uh, what you've stated is that the developer has not reached out to the neighbors? No, not at all. There's been no consultation? Uh, to this no, uh, actually, no, I, I heard about this by another neighbor th that found out because he lives just very close to the property, but no, we have never been consulted. And this is a big, big impact on the property, okay. on, the, on the area. What, what are your, uh, just asking uh, out of curiosity, what are your, uh, what's your position on infill? What is my position? On infill. On infill. Do you approve of Oh no, I, I, I don't approve the, the project. No, no. Not, not the project, but infill in general. Uh, the new houses that are being built to replace the old ones. Oh, no, I mean, I think that it should be kept as, as a two families. I mean, I am okay if they build a duplex for two families, they, there was another one built two houses from mine. So instead of one family, two family living in a lot, it doesn't change dramatically, but going from two families to eight, it's a huge, I mean, you're talking about like 60 people living in a property where it's not, I mean, we lost green spaces, we lost, it will dramatically uh, change the, the flow, the traffic. Uh, again, I mean, I, I live on the other side of the street, but I can imagine leaving your house and having all these garage beans and, and then you cannot park, you have family and someone left, someone visiting that property left the car in, in your back lane and you don't know, you have 16 apartments to go and ring the bell to see, sorry, is, is your car there? I mean, I don't, I don't, this is a residential neighborhood. It's, it's a character neighborhood and we have to, to respect that and to keep it. Okay. I, I was request to keep it. I was request to, present the design, to respect the style, to get all the signatures. So everybody should be on the same, uh, requested to do the same. So uh, just last last point, um, you're, in terms of where this is located, you are aware that uh, there, it's high transit frequency network that, you know, both Pemina Highway and uh, Jubilee that, uh, you know, again, from a transit perspective, quick uh, and easy access to, to a high frequency network? Oh, yes, I, I, I am aware, but the building is on Jubilee, it's not on Pembina. But it's it's probably a two, three minute walk from Pembina Highway if I, based on the map that I'm seeing here. Okay, but if, if that gets approved and then one next to my house try to get approved, they will use that property as, as a... As, as a reference that well if they were approved why not me mm -hmm. so it's very hard to see well and uh, but again these people the building is on jubilee where are they going to park mm -hmm. they will not go park on pembina they will park on jubilee or in the back that back lane will be really 
very con congested. I mean, it's, I don't see 16 properties. I think it's a little bit way too high. It's a bit too aggressive in your opinion? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for, for, for a lot that is for a one family, two family stops have eight. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, no, you're welcome. Next. Next, we have uh, Benny Wisnowski. Hi, Benny. You're now live with the committee. You'll have up to 10 minutes for your presentation after you state your name. Hello, everyone. My name is Unmute. My family and I live 920 Jubilee Avenue. I currently own our Kentucky Corn Monarch. Yeah, yeah. Can everybody hear me or not? Sorry, Benny. We're just having some audio difficulties. We can't hear you. Um, can't hear it. Let me try a different mic now. Okay, is that better? Yeah, I can hear you now. Perfect. Okay, so the, um, um, sorry, let me start over. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is Benny Gisnowski. My family and I live at 920 Jubilee Avenue. We jointly own our duplex with my mother, Heather, who lives at 918. Her side borders the lots in discussion. It's unfortunate that so many current city of Winnipeg infill guidelines and zoning laws are being disregarded. We all have a lot of money invested in this neighborhood. If you plan on changing the rules of the area we've already invested in, it should be transparent and include those most directly affected, not done in a closed door meeting with the developer. You then place this on the laps of the neighbors to fight your decision instead of including us as part of the process. That doesn't seem very fair or neighborly. The average home homeowner does not have the know-how or is brave enough to step up and fight against the city. It's particularly difficult during, during this time of code red COVID-19 lockdown. There's no opportunity for us to gather personally and discuss this as a community. There is not an ideal opportunity to canvas the neighborhood for support. Most of us know each other to say hi, but do not have phone numbers or email addresses to contact everybody. And then there's the crash course in, in reading and learning. The plan winnipeg our winnipeg the city of winnipeg zoning bylaw the city of winnipeg charter infill development guidelines small scale and low-rise re residential development guidelines for mature communities wow that's a big one most of these run you in a loop continually referring to each other just to justify their statements as per zoning bylaw as per our winnipeg etc cetera, etc cetera. how many years does it take being on city council to actually finally have a good understanding of it all how can you possibly expect average joe neighbor to have any idea where to start when they've been blindsided at Christmas with a January 1 appeal deadline date. And then let's discuss Joe Neighbor. <clears throat> this is a mature neighborhood with mature residents, a few of which didn't even know how to use email well enough to send in their appeal email and it required assistance from family and friends. They want to show support at this meeting, but don't have Zoom and or are not comfortable in this situation where we can't be together as a group for moral support. These people may have attended in person, if not for COVID. The rest have jobs and aren't able to or can't afford to take the day off to be part of this. It's easy to have all the developers, architects, owners, consultants attend. They get paid to do it. It's their job. It's not our job to fight against the city that shouldn't have been allowed for changes that shouldn't have been allowed in the first place. R2 zoning is two family. I can't for the life of me figure out how it has gotten to this point. To be fair, unless you are familiar with the area and the lots, it would be easy to get conned by the developer's information he presented in his applications. I'd like to um, share my screen here. I've got a bit of a presentation. I think it was circulated around. Is that okay? Someone? Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Are we good? Can you see it or not? Uh, yeah. I just see a black screen. Um, it says I'm sharing. Let's try again. Ah. Oh, sure. Oh, crying out loud. Oh, brother. Okay, so now what? <laughs> I think that you've all had an opportunity to, uh, to review the, uh, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to review the information that I also sent around. Frozen here. I love technology. Um, can we move on to somebody else and then I can come back to this? 
Um, we can take a couple of minutes till you resolve the issue. Sure, I appreciate that. I may have to restart my computer. Uh -oh. um, Council Chambers, I'm going to go get a coffee if that's okay. Yeah, let's uh, reset for two minutes then. Thank you. I appear to assist research Okay, and we are back. We have resolved the uh, technical difficulties and we'll continue on with Benny's presentation. Mr. <sighs> Sorry about that. You know, it's. Um... <laughs> This is probably a good testament to the, the fact that the neighbors aren't very tech savvy because I, I use Zoom quite often actually. <laughs> so I apologize for the, uh, for the inconvenience. The, um, so going through this presentation, as I think you all have copies of it, I just wanted to, to kind of give you a sense of, of what actually is, is happening, and what's going on in, with this property. So these are a couple of views from the summertime. Of course, this is all through Google Maps that I've had to get the, um, information, including these two single family homes that were there. I'm the, at the bottom of the page there, I'm the house on the, uh, on the right. Um, the uh, two half single family houses were there when we purchased our home in, two, in 17 years ago now. Uh, on the lot, there's a number of, uh, a number of mature trees. The, the developers said that they're going to leave four at the front, but they're going to have to cut down everything, including, um, I don't know, this tree next door has got to be 45 feet tall pine tree that's uh, on the property and a bunch of mature trees through right up to the back lane. Um, showing a few pictures there on the right. So from the, from the street, this is after the, after the um, buildings were gone. You can see that the height of the, of the current buildings that are in the neighborhood. Oops. Ah. This is what they plan on building. Um, and that's basically the scale. I tried to be as accurate as I could. I'm not an architect, but this was uh, a pretty accurate representation of, of the scale of these buildings um, in, the, in the two properties that they're proposing. So I know that they've said that they're 37 or 38 and a half feet, um, but 38 and a half feet isn't the actual height of them. The actual height is 42 feet, one and three eighths inches tall. The five feet four, five foot four inches, just from the grade to main floor, which is well above, um, it's already into our living room window where the front, where the first floor is. 29 feet, seven and three eighths inches from main floor to eaves and another seven feet, two inches from the eaves to the roof, putting this property 17 plus feet taller than our house and the adjacent houses. And we're some of the tallest houses in the neighborhood uh, currently. So on the overhead view, you can see where all the mature trees are on these two lots uh, in the center. This is the size of the property they've proposed, which sits almost 50% further back into the yards than, than uh, ours do. They've got the row of, <laughs> of soldiers full of garbage cans at the back here that uh, can barely fit onto their, onto their property in one row, much less be pulled into a place for pickup. And this is kind of the, the um, running from the examples that they said in the, in the plans that they submitted. Uh, this is the size of the, of the building where they parked right up against the back lane. There's no room for stopping. There's no room for anything, no unloading, loading. Now they talk about public consultation. They claim to have public consultation and that somebody came around and, you know, said, oh, well, you know, my neighbor thinks it'll be okay because, uh, because um, I think it's okay or, you know, I talked to some lady on the street who kind of lives down the block. I didn't really get an address, but she thought it'd be okay too. You know, if, if speaking to Flavia's comments where she had to go and solicit everybody all along her block and get signed, um, signed confirmation that they all thought it was okay. We didn't have any kind of, any kind of approach like that. The couple people that, that had, uh, uh, that had been spoken with and that indicated that they were, uh, in favor of doing something. When the developer came by, the, um, he had expressed that it was gonna be a couple of duplexes. You know, they were gonna clean up the neighborhood nice. It was gonna be, the, you know, they're tired of the empty lots and they were gonna build some nice duplexes. And that's what garnered the support of some of the people around it. They didn't for one minute uh, indicate the size of the, of the complexes they were planning on building against our, our homes. You know, we had over the last weekend when it was minus 30 something degrees in COVID, 
uh, we canvassed the neighborhood to see, you know, who's, who's going to be in favor of this? Well, the people in red were the ones we were able to speak with, and they all signed our, our letter of uh, supporting the appeal that I'm sure you got the 80 plus copies of um, that we had done. The numbers here indicate multifamily dwellings that, uh, that um, are currently in the area. The, the five is the sixplex down at 868. So how do you get to these properties? There's no access from Jubilee uh, to the cars on these properties. Rapid transit construction um, to accommodate the bus route here removed all parking and stopping zones in our area for, I don't know, half a kilometer up the road. Close to stopping zone on Z Jubilee Avenue is near Riverside Drive. All parcel deliveries, taxis, meal delivery services, etc., are forced to use our back lane. There's no place to stop while making a delivery as the variance for parking is right up against the back lane. There's no room for two cars to pass in the back lane unless one pulls on the private property. Currently, the most used delivery spot for vehicles unable to maneuver the back lane is on private property down on the corner in the Fountain, Par Fountain Tire parking lot. The top left picture indicates the actual usability width of the, of the back lane that's facing east. The picture below it faced, faces west towards uh, Pemina Highway, and it's not even passable for uh, any more than a single car. Uh, overhead power lines and utility lines in the back make it dangerous for large truck deliveries and impossible for, BF, for any kind of BFI container removal. And while parking pressed right up against the back lane, vehicles would be forced to use private property to get out of their spots. It's indicated in that red, um, red square there, tra trapezoid. The same private property will be deliveries that stopping zones, including our property and the property at 910 and the other adjacent properties to, to, the, uh, to the red trapezoid there. So where, so where do these people park? They've got 60 to 80 people that are gonna be living in these apartments. Uh, with effectively nine regular parking stalls. So the only available parking, there's no stopping anywhere along Jubilee, right down past Riverside, you're not allowed to park. Or the uh, parking, people are going to have to wander around onto, onto Merriam Avenue, which is, I don't know, a far. It's, it's a long way down to the corner and around. Or across onto Argue Street, which is the angled one going up and down there, or on the, onto Rosedale. That's the only available parking for, for people. So over and above the, the nine spots they have, they'll have um, guests and whatever, either parking currently at the Fountain Tire parking spot. And Fountain Tire has said, you know, it's, it's already uh, enough of the people coming into, into our lot. If it gets to be a problem with this many more people, we're just gonna run a wall up along our property and let everybody uh, continue to use the back lane. Handy accessible. No, it's eight steps up to the main floor, five feet, four inches. There's four floors tall, no elevator. You, you know, this whole maturity where you can age in place uh, is not consistent with these buildings. They've designed handicap accessible parking stalls and they're the two furthest from the entrance. Uh, they also have them facing right up against the, the two sides. Peg City Co-op, car co-op. The letter that they submitted says that uh, Peg City Co-op has spoken with the developer regarding possibility and that no formal contract has been signed. If, they, if there was such a commitment to this, why is there not a signed contract with contingency? In my conversation with Peg City Co-op, this property does not qualify due to their placement criteria. One, they want two cars placed close together in case there's a problem, you know, either mechanical or the, the previous person ref, uh, failed to return it on time, etc. Their focus is on downtown oh. with higher... Hello. Hello. Hi. Yeah, you've run out of your 10 minutes. Do you, uh, how much more time would you require? Um, I'm going to require probably another seven or eight minutes. I can give you two. Okay. Well, I'm going to take up some of my son's time then um, and finish this presentation. No, uh, not how that works. We can give you an, ex you can have somebody move an extension of two minutes. Can you wrap up in two minutes? Uh, I doubt it. I can sure try though. Okay, all in favor? Okay, so they do not want cars. The other point is they don't do not, and the most important is they do not want cars in their back lanes for both visibility and safety reasons. They're also making the assumption that the residents will purchase the $500 membership share and pay the monthly fee to be part of the Peg City Co-op in addition to the per user fees. Environmental, waste and water. At the division's request, the applicant contacted the waste and water department and received feedback regarding land drainage and discharge. Has an actual report, written report been submitted or are you just trusting his, his claim? Is there a written report from the water and waste department regarding the impact and availability to accommodate another 60 to 80 people's liquid waste and fresh water demands? They were told that the city 
a collection wouldn't be able to accommodate the garbage. Uh, is there a contract for private collection in place? Shadow study. Has a shadow study been done to assess the impact of the, on the surrounding properties due to the size of these buildings? These buildings are over 42 feet tall and tower over the surrounding area. Is there a fire marshal's report on the serviceability and accessibility of these buildings for safety of the residents and surrounding homes? Does the hydrants have capacity to extinguish a major fire? The transit front entrance. A previous design showed an entrance facing the rear and not the front. At the request of the division, the applicant provided the main entrance to the front. This shows that they did not design these buildings with the intent to link them to the rapid transit corridor as the front entrance faced the back lane with no direct exits to Jubilee Avenue. There's no vehicle access to this building on Jubilee Avenue. All traffic must come through the back lane. They recognize the Jubilee Avenue access problem and uh, in the initial design and move the front to the back lane. Walking score doesn't score very well. Their closest um, bus stop is down by the Pem or Cambridge Hotel and everybody walks through the back lane which is not ideal for pedestrian safety. You guys are using 868 as the model on why they should be a little bigger. 868 is, is a unique is unique compared to this. It has three points of access. It's built on a, on a Y at the back lane. They have 12 parking spots. Uh, we were able to speak with five of the six residents and they all signed petitions, all signed their petition stating that their building they thought was too large for the location. Here's some different things. Here's on the bottom left where the uh, actual back lane feeds over into their other back lane for maneuverability. Uh, City of Winnipeg small cell guidelines. What are the considerations? Building mass. This is more than 17 feet taller than the adjacent okay. homes and twice the footprint. Yes. Great. We've reached the two minutes. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I know it might be a little frustrating, but we, you know, we have so many people to get through uh, today with respect to this matter that's being heard that we've okay, got. Well, would you like my son to finish the presentation then, or my wife? That you can, that if you so choose, that that's fine. Right. So we'll just move on to the next uh, person registered. Or are there any questions of Mr. Gosnowski? I do have one question um, with regards to your back lane, the yes. way it's currently configured when snow falls and snow accumulations occur. Uh, does the city plow your back lane? Uh, they do the odd time. Uh, they just leave a big windrow along the edge though. And you can see, I mean, this is a picture is taken right now. It's certainly not uh, plowed where it's easy enough to get out of the ruts in the back lane to pass a car. Uh, are, where, where did they pile the snow uh, or do they remove the snow from your back lane? I know you said they don't, they don't remove it. They just run the plow up the middle and just push it to the sides. So with this further uh, having uh, now the potential of how many cars that are, I, I guess there's a, an amount of parking stalls that would likely be included, but with this further exacerbates, uh, snow pile up in the area, especially with the amount of bins that would be required. We're looking at garbage bin as well as recycling bin, and then the potential amount of cars that are there with this further exacerbate our already difficult situation as far as snow uh, removal during the winter times in your, in your opinion? Absolutely. Currently those two lots are empty and we want something built there and duplexes are appropriate. The uh, reality is, is now they're gonna have a hundred feet of back lane that they have to find room for snow somewhere. And they don't have enough room in the back lane to, to put it anywhere. There's gonna be no corners to pile it up. They are butting the cars right up against the back lane with nowhere to maneuver anything back there. And it's just gonna make it so much worse because it's already a bad situation. Thank you. And it's the only access to the property. There's no stopping. Our, our block is across from, across from the overpass. There is no stopping anywhere on our block. They can't let out a cab. They can't let out anybody. Everything, everything has to come into the back lane. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, uh, and no other uh, further questions. Next presenter. Next, we have Heather Gusnowski. Morning, Heather. You're now live with the committee. You'll have up to 10 minutes for your back. Heather, we just need you to unmute yourself. I think we can hear on this. Sorry about that. 
Hi, my name is Heather Kutowski and I live at 918. Uh, just going to have to use headphones and the microphone. Sorry, Heather, we're just having a hard time hearing you. You're just very quiet. If you could either maybe turn up the volume on your mic or perhaps use headphones. I have got headphones on and I don't know what the problem is. Um, hey, that's better now. If I get closer, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, that's better. Okay. Hi, my name is Heather Kusnowski and I live at 918 Jubilee Avenue, next door to the proposed building for 912 and 914 Jubilee. Since we purchased the property in 2004, several significant changes have taken place. The property at 912 and 914 were single family dwellings on both lots. There was parking available on Jubilee. The rapid transit system using the front of our street to access the transit corridor did not exist and the green space across the street was not used to collect overflow water from the underpass. Understandably, changes occur in all neighborhoods. However, I have serious concerns about the changes proposed to 912 and 914 Jubilee. The city has approved two eight unit buildings to replace the single family dwellings that previously existed on these properties. If these two apartment buildings are built, they will impede any access I have to morning sun, they will leave no room for green space, they increase noise levels, and most importantly, increase traffic in our back lane, which is already overtaxed due to changes and restrictions on the front street. Since the former single family dwellings have been demolished, the property has become an eyesore, overgrown with weeds and often attracting indigent uh, individuals who frequently sleep there and leave their garbage. I would welcome the, re the development of this next door property. However, I believe a more positive choice would be a development with duplexes, not eight plexes, that will tower over the neighborhood properties and create some significant problems. For example, <clears throat> the noise levels in the summer will be intolerable with an additional 16 air conditioning units. I will no longer have privacy in my backyard uh, and other people will not as well. A building with a height of 40 plus feet will provide access to a full view of my yard and others. In addition, the, and depending on window placement, residents will also be able to look into my upstairs windows. A singularly serious issue for the approved 16 units is garbage access and collection. Where are the developers going to put 32 additional garbage bins? Presently, existing garbage bins and are often left partway in the alley after being emptied. Garbage crew frequently leave bins in disarray. The back lane is not well maintained by the city, and I wonder how the addition of 32 bins will affect collection. Also, the back lane is poorly maintained by the city. In the winter, deep ruts of ice form and drivers have considerable difficulty maneuvering their vehicles. In the summer, because of the grade, the lane frequently fills with water that does not drain properly. There is not room for two cars to pass each other unless one of them goes onto prop private property. My understanding is that the parking for this proposed development will be right to the lane. Another serious <clears throat> issue uh, with the proposed plan is parking availability. In this section of Jubilee, the city has removed legal parking or even stopping on Jubilee, and this includes FedEx and the like. The back lane has become their main access for property owners. Parking is at a premium, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to all property owners and their guests. What kind of proposed parking solutions accompany this building plan. Realistically, 16 family units will certainly require a minimum of 16 parking places. What accommodation will be made for guest parking? For handicap parking? What about snow? Where will it go? Because of high traffic volume on Jubilee, people often stroll in the back lane. Additional traffic will create a safety issue. What is the city's objective for approving these buildings? The developer said he had spoken to, the, uh, to me regarding this plan. He has not spoken to me. And in spite of his claim, other neighbors have received all manners of conflicting versions of the plan 
or not been contacted at all. Frankly, the plan to develop 912 and 914 Jubilee, replacing single family dwellings with two eight unit apartment buildings seems to be a plan motivated by greed and not the interests of the neighborhood and the people who have lived here for many years. There is, little there is little correlation between the needs of the people that live on this west end of Jubilee and the unrealistic goals of this developer. That concludes my reasons for appeal. Thank you. Are there any questions of uh, Mrs. Gisnowski? Seeing none, next presenter. Okay, so next we have registered Michelle Hari, uh, but she is not in the waiting room right now. Um, we also have Annette Gilborn, George Amabil, and Sandy Fraser all registered. Um, okay. Michelle Hari, I am in the waiting room. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry for that, Michelle. Oh, that's okay. I've been here in the waiting room since the beginning. Okay, you'll have up to 10 minutes after you state your name. Okay, my name is Michelle. Last name is Howry. It's H-A-U-R-I. Thank you. I live immediately behind the, uh, the properties in question on Miriam Boulevard, directly across the back lane. Um, I have several points to make um, as to why this is not a good proposal for this. Uh, one of the points I wanted to make was in, in the, uh, in the city, uh, report, it talks about having a maximum density of 800 square feet per dwelling unit. This is far exceeded by the applicant with a proposal of 965 square feet per unit. The current parcel of land cannot accommodate this many units at this increased size per unit. The height of the building is listed in the report as three stories high. In essence, it is three and a half stories high. This is well beyond the height of the surrounding buildings on Jubilee. All other buildings have a maximum of two stories. This would not suit the characteristics of this neighborhood. With R1 zoned houses directly behind these empty lots, all single family homes, this is not the location to start building higher and higher. If this is allowed to be approved, what comes next? 10 units with five floors directly behind, beside or behind single family homes? There should be some recognition for the types of dwellings that exist in this area and what is reasonable in terms of size. In the report, it talks about diversifying the types of buildings within mature neighborhoods. As mentioned, there are two, three, and four unit buildings along with a single five unit building and one six unit building that came up in 2018 down the block. These provide diversity to the neighborhood already. Does every proposal have to be bigger than the last one that was built? If you look at the sixplex, most people in this area would agree that this is already far too big for this area's services, amenities, and safety of this neighborhood. So to supersede that example twice, side by side, this will only cause more problems to this adjoining properties and adjoining areas. It's not compatible with the area where they are situating it. We've had multiple problems with the sixplex, including soil removal, the garbage and recycling bins, and parking problems. The six car spots have 12 vehicles parked end to end and when garbage day comes along all the 12 garbage and recycling units end up in the back lane blocking traffic from flowing easily through that section as mentioned by the other um, appellants the lane is only one car width so in order to pass vehicles moving in the opposite direction at any juncture vehicles are constantly driving onto private property to get around one another if the parking spots for these two aplexes go from one end of the property to the other, where exactly are the garbage and recycling bins to go when it's time for collection? 32 receptacles, two feet apart, spaced one foot, two feet wide, sorry, um, spaced one foot apart per the city rules that they should not be, be right next to each other for collection day. This will take 96 feet. Um, there, in the servicing section of the analysis and issues from the report, there's mention of private garbage and recycling services in order to maximize the parking and minimize variance. Does this mean that the collection of these items will not be done by the city of Winnipeg? If so, what type of schedule will be maintained? These, it's, not, it's not totally clear what they meant by private uh, garbage services in the report. So 
again, um, how will the collection take place with the overhead wires if they can't get the appropriate equipment to empty these bins? These, uh, these questions have, have not been answered, and it causes some concern. Well, where will the bin be located in the property if they're not doing individual bins? So now, how much of the green space will now be, will be occupied by the garbage bins? If the bins are placed behind the vehicles on collection day, this will essentially prevent myself and my husband from being able to access our property with our vehicles as the lane is too narrow. Even just for them to pull out of their parking spots directly on the lane will actually, they will likely enter our private property space to even just to pull in and out from these parking spots. Under the criteria for approval B, this does create a substantial adverse effect on the amenities, use, and convenience of our adjoining property. Parcel contradicts with Article D is compatible with the area in which the property to be affected is situated. Compatible, by definition, is an adjective of two things able to exist or occur together without conflict. I don't see how this can exist without conflict. By looking at the developer's diagrams, there's no space for snow removal and storage of snow. There's also no space for visitors, service vehicles, loading and unloading, food deliveries, taxis, goods to be delivered with the current plan. The only place for those is either halting traffic in the back lane or parking in private properties surrounding the lots, as there's no stopping on Jubilee. Imagine people who don't have access to vehicles also don't have access to delivery services due to the parameters set out in this plan. It's unacceptable for neighbors and tenants for this future building and will only lead to conflict. Much more reasonable approach is to have sufficient parking space to allow for visitor parking and loading built into the plan with less units in these buildings. Will these tenants follow the sixplex example of doubling the amount of cars in each parking spot? Only time will tell. The building proposal will substantially adversely affect the existing infrastructure, including the back lane water runoff, sewage, and internet services. The current back lane drainage has issues. Every single year in the spring it floods and the city has worked on this problem multiple times without success. The drain doesn't drain properly and floods the whole back alley in the section of these properties. This then drains onto Miriam Boulevard and the drain source system has had multiple servicings done in the last few years. I can't imagine potentially 64 more people contributing to this, plus the extra runoff from these rather large buildings as well. The diminished green space will contribute to further water runoff issues in comparison to the previous state of grass and trees and much smaller dwellings that were on these properties. It will only compound the problem of our age sewer system with well-known issues. Internet services are on network nodes in the neighborhood, and so the more people that use this, the slower your connections are with dropping of signals, even at times. This greatly affects everyone's quality of life in this modern age. Working from home and spending time at home has become a reality during this pandemic. This translates to higher internet usage for everyone. It must be considered in this proposal. Proposed buildings are in an appropriate location for additional density given its proximity to high quality transit service and dedicated off street cycling infrastructure. Per the report, for the last year, most of the high quality transit service has worked on a much reduced Sunday service due to COVID to the pandemic, which has now become the new norm. Without knowing when or if we will actually return to normal services, these variances will severely affect the quality of life for these new tenants. Morality may never fully recover. We don't know. Plan to not allow sufficient parking spots for the people that live there is unreasonable, especially with no space on Jubilee for stopping of any kind. The variances on the height of the building and no guest parking at six parking spaces instead of ten have all been commented in this statement already. The remaining variance that there is no buffering of a parking area located within 20 feet of the north side and rear lot lines adjacent to the residential district is the final one to discuss. Having no buffering to the lane will cause injurious effect to the artery crumbling back lane. When the city plows and leaves the trail of snow, ice and debris in the windrow on the sides of the lanes, this will create issues if the cars are directly parked against the back lane. Where will all the snow be stored for the six months of winter in Winnipeg? Questions and problems leave me with only one conclusion. This is not suitable for this lot with the current infrastructure in place. So I'd like to add just a few more notes about the public consultation for the record. I live on Marion Boulevard, as I previously stated. 
I was not consulted about this project prior to the submission by the developer. Written statement by the developer has my neighbor's name as the person living at my address. It also states that the majority of the surrounding properties were in agreement of this building. This is not true. Had the developer left anything in the mailbox about contacting him on this project proposal after not reaching us at home, we would have reached out to say we don't approve the size of this building and had other comments about not agreeing. We were not given that opportunity. For the public open house guidelines for developers for the City of Winnipeg, consultation of the surrounding neighbors should occur with an open house prior to the proposal being submitted. This did not occur. Multiple documents were submitted to the sur about the surrounding neighbors not supporting this building, as mentioned by Mr. Gisnowski in his, pr in his presentation. Uh, this, this just contradicts his statement of, we spoke to the immediate neighbors who were all in support. This process has been nothing but stressful for many of us. I'm no. sorry. Um, during, during this COVID pandemic with freezing cold temperatures, short deadlines to meet over the holiday season for this appeal. Hey, uh, the motion developer and not pushing through. I just want to say it's, it's been very difficult. Sure. Thank you for your time and Thank consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, before uh, before we ask if there's any questions, I'll just give you uh, a quick moment to to, uh, to to compose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions of my council colleagues? Um. Just, I'll just add one more thing. I would encourage anybody who has any doubt on the validity of the statement, drive the back lane during the winter on a garbage day. You can see the mayhem for yourself. Thank you. I am, I'm ready to answer questions if there are any. Are there any questions of my council colleagues? I just wanted to thank you for your presentation. Uh, it is a difficult time overall uh, for everyone and, and um, Things like this in front of us are, are very emotional because it's affecting where we live in our neighborhood. I want to thank you very much for your comments today. So I appreciate it. Okay. Can we can we just do one more uh, presenter and then break for lunch? There's one more medal. Yeah. So, oh. so um we have registered Annette Wilborn and George Amabil. Uh, they're not speaking, but provided written submission, which has been circulated to the members. And we also have Sandy Frazier, who registered, but is not speaking, and also provided a written submission, which has been circulated to the members. And that's all we have for the appellants. So, Madam Clerk, the next step would be those in support. So I'd like to propose that we take a recess what? at this time. Uh, if no, 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 no. I'd like to propose that we take a recess at this time. And then when we come back to the meeting, Mr. Chair, we could hear from those um, in, in, in support, support, I suppose would be the next step, if there are any. So given the hour, yeah. Yes, proposing a recess uh, until 12.45, does that work? Sounds good. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Can we just uh, maybe say into the screen so the others know that are watching and we're all very clear? Sure. So for those of you listening on Zoom, we are taking a recess of 45 minutes. We will put you in the waiting room and when the meeting resumes, we will bring you back in. Oh, sorry, half an hour, half hour lunch. We'll resume at 1245 and then we'll bring you back into the meeting at that time. Thank you. And we're back. Uh, thank you for your uh, patience and, and uh, uh, allowing us to, to eat lunch where we can now focus on the uh, tasks at hand. Uh, we're fed, we're uh, in a better mind space now as well. So uh, continuing on uh, with those in support. Thank you, Councillor. Next, we'll hear from those in support of the appeal. Councillor Rollins. Thank you and, and good afternoon. 
and welcome back for lunch committee. Um, first committee, I, I do want to give you my heartfelt thanks. I, I did review uh, the meeting earlier and I know the residents are really feeling the full range of emotions today with respect to this. And so I just want to acknowledge the humanity um, that you showed the residents of Fort Rouge's Fort Gary um, and, and, you know, uh, that was in the compassion really that you showed uh, my residents. I'm, 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 I'm grateful to you for that. As you know, appeal committee to approve a conditional use application subject to conditions, you must consider criteria as prescribed under the City of Winnipeg Charter Act, that the application is consistent with Plan Winnipeg and any, any applicable secondary plan does not create a substantial adverse effect on the amenities use, safety and convenience of the adjoining property and adjacent area, including an area separated from the property by a street or waterway is the minimum modification of zoning bylaw required to relieve the injurious effect on the zoning bylaw on an applicant's property and is compatible with the area in which the property to be affected is situated. I, I need not tell you this, you, you know already. So I will be arguing today that these plans, uh, these buildings create substantial adverse effects on the use, safety, and convenience of adjoining properties and the whole of the adjacent area, and that this proposal is simply not compatible with the area. I'm going to argue further that, and, that you should adjourn and allow for changes to these plans. I'm going to first forward arguments well known to the committee. Some, some not so known, but some I think that are known because you are IRPW. And I've appeared before you as IRPW before, in fact. And some of that appearance is germane to this plan. There's a back lane here that's a problem. Uh, you've heard some concerns from the residents. Calls for service, though, uh, in my office, you may not know. I think it calls into the question the administration's assertion that this is modest density. I'm gonna argue specific elements that are a reminder to you, ones you've seen presented to you before at IRPW, motions by Councillor Lukes, myself, that I've spoken to you about regarding Dowker and the end caps and how that is treated along Pemba, Pembina. And I'm gonna argue that adjacent areas like Miriam, and you've heard from some of my residents from Miriam, are already feeling the effects of density, they're adverse, and that the administration, administration's precedent that they point to as an example actually is deeply troubling for myself and my residents, given my casework, as well as their troubles in the back lane. And I'll also argue the size and scope of this project isn't compatible with the area in which the property is situated. And as a result, I wanna say on this point that you've already heard concerns about this as well. With respect to the back lane, it doesn't drain properly. So the loss of trees here is problematic. Additionally, the density does not represent modest change. It represents a hazard both for residents in Jubilee and on Miriam. It, there's an exacerbation of snow piling up here. And the precedent that the administration points to is actually problematic with respect to that snow pile up, just in terms of my casework. With respect to uh, the water, this back lane is just not draining. I have done several walkabouts in this back lane uh, well prior to uh, these lots looking at development. The walkabouts will persist, as you know, because the budget is what it is for rejuvenating back lanes. Specific elements, I want to remind you with respect to IRPW. Councillor Luke's motioned on Dowker all along. All along Pembina, there is a phenomenon of commercial at end caps. Quite simply, you're going to be creating a drive through for one of my businesses on the corner of Jubilee and Fountain Tire, and that is problematic. I'll tell you right now, as a, as a city councillor, I'm going to hear from that owner. The parking isn't safe. Moreover, Jubilee is isn't you can't park on it so i'll note that the only entrance in and out here is through a business parking lot i'll note that 
This has been a subject of motions, casework, both my own and Councillor Luke's, in terms of the safety issues brought up by RRP, at RRPW, something that the director committed to working on, but that work is not complete and you're uniquely positioned to know that. I want you to understand that this end street already has an island effect and by introducing this level of density, you'll only be increasing this. But please note, what sets the stage for administration's arguments and positive arguments in favor is the opportunity of bus rapid transit. So I want you to examine really closely the changes that administration had to seek. There was never going to be a door, a front door, so that residents of those buildings can hop on to transit. This was car oriented development from the start and the proof is right in front of you in the administrative reports. There was not going to be a front door. That was a change administration sought. It was a good change, but it was, it's the reason why I want you to adjourn. It's the reasons why I want you to listen to my residents, listen to work that I've been in front of you at IRPW before, because this section of the administrative report, it's called collaborative planning. This changed, but I, I will argue, and I believe my residents have argued, that the intention here was not to take the bus and be transit oriented. This was heavy lifting by administration and it's too heavy lifting. I don't want you to accept it. I want you to adjourn and, and, and reconnect with the developer. Contextually from the start, this development was deliberatively oriented towards increasing traffic on the back lane, a back lane that simply cannot handle it. I know from my casework for sure, I, you do too, from your hard work at IRPW. So it was only at the request of the division that the applicant provided the main entrance. I'm sure the applicant will come before you and say that that was a mistake, it absolutely was. But it doesn't change the point of my presentation. This isn't a development that this neighborhood wants. Moreover, it's beyond inadequate in terms of space. It's really shoehorning. You're gonna get no arguments from me that development is appropriate on vacant land and a higher and best use for this land is a development. I, you've heard my residents say, give me a duplex. That's not common in appeals, as you know give me a duplex. From an economic perspective, I really understand administration's report, I do. But this is what appeals are for. They're to provide the context. So I, I want you to understand this back lane will not be a back lane, it'll be a new street. The densification orients to the back lane, the safety and convenience will be impacted adversely with respect to this and this is both issues that you've heard today and issues you've heard before from me and Councillor Lukes at IRPW. You have the power to change this today and, and, and I want you appeal committee to hear my arguments here and ultimately I want you to seek changes, adjourn in order to assure the most protection for my residents in East Fort Gary. Thank you for your time today. Uh, Councillor Rollins. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I have a question when you're ready. Um, are there any questions of my council colleagues, uh, whether on Zoom or in the chamber? Myself, yeah. Councillor Sharma. Thank you, Councillor Rollins, for your presentation today. Very detailed presentation. Can you just reiterate uh, what outcome you're looking for today? Um, any recommendations for change? You mentioned adjournment. Um, just if you could be specific, what are you suggesting here today with this file? Well, you know, at the point where there's such a wholesale change uh, through, through the chair to Councillor Sharma, uh, I'm in favor of an adjournment. And here's why. When there's such a wholesale change, um, you know, with respect to variances, uh, I, I 
if I were you, I, and, and you see the tandem parking in the example administration has, administration will say, that's illegal, you know, shouldn't have tandem parking there, but the variance shouldn't be accepted. At the point where height shouldn't be accepted, uh, at the point where the conditional use shouldn't be accepted, I think you're looking at wholesale changes. So I think the best thing to do at that point is to adjourn. I, as a councillor, don't like to redesign buildings and say, oh, just lop off a story or just turn them and orient them to a duplex. That's up to you, uh, to Councillor Charma through the chair. But at this point, I think the responsible thing to do is to adjourn and uh, reconnect uh, administration with direction uh, to, uh, you know, to, to a, a, a duplex. Yeah, we do need to make some decision today and uh, <clears throat> adjourning the matter usually means coming back. So uh, you're suggesting uh, for a period of time work with the administration and come to a better outcome that the residents can get behind. Yeah, because it, 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 it factors design. So I, I don't, I, I personally don't like when councillors take their pen and lob off a floor and say, you know, you know, there you go. It, 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 it really requires more thoughtful design work um, and to, you know, redo a building. Uh, you know, if, if the next best thing to adjournment and regrouping is a smaller density, that would be my next position that I would, I would forward to you. But I just simply think there's too much design work here that needs to be rethought and redone uh, you know, given the problems on the back lane, it's and, too large. And what period of time are you suggesting for the uh, adjournment slash layover? Um, well, you know, I would ask administration that question. I think two months, um, you know, would, would, uh, be appropriate given, I think that this is. Okay. Thank you. Thank um, you for your questions. And thank you for your presentation. I mean, I think I addressed the same concerns this morning with respect to snow, snow removal, cool. as well as transit. Uh, the fact that there is, um, uh, you know, uh, Pemina Highway is a, a transportation corridor, just ad uh, uh, adjacent to that is, is the uh, rapid transit line as well. But the development itself, as you mentioned, I can just, reviewing that doesn't have front doors. It's, it's, they're facing one another at the side of the property. So again, not transit oriented development. Um, I'm looking at the report here and it says collaborative planning. The applicant worked with the urban planning uh, division to make adjustments to the project. Specifically, the following statements were made to the development through the collaborative planning process leading up to the re, uh, reception of the application or the receipt of the application. I'm uh, not certain if, in, in terms of that collaborative planning, if there was, and I'm hearing from residents this morning, uh, to your knowledge, was there a fairly consultative process with the residents and stakeholders uh, in the planning of this project? Well, to your, to your knowledge. Thank you for that question, Mr. Chair. Look, I think it would be enough to adjourn due to insufficient consultation here. Um, and on principle, I do. It wasn't sufficient with respect to size and scope. I, I'll say my, my, my position on consultation is it should be relative to the size and scope of the development, right? Um, you know, I, I don't think if you're rebuilding a house next door, nothing more than, you know, just talking to your adjacent neighbor, if, if you're just going to rebuild after a fire is needed, right? As a matter of fact, they should probably talk to you. But with respect to size and scope, I, I just think it should be scaled. And, you know, here residents have a unique story about, uh, you know, actually they were successful in adjourning um, to this meeting. This was originally scheduled for February 4th and it was through their intervention and they may have shared that with you, mm -hmm. um, that that changed. But in the meantime, you know, there are discrepancies uh, that I was alert to uh, with respect to attempts at consultation. Um, and, and that is concerning. 
especially given the efforts um, that they have made, whether it's petitions or just, you know, the walks that they have taken to verify the consultation that is being alleged and asserted here. So there are some discrepancies and, and so, you know, it would be enough perhaps to adjourn and, and regroup due to insufficient consultations on principle. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, the desire here, and I think quite reasonably through the residents here, is to see development, but see development suited to the neighborhood. They are, you know, again, we, we rarely hear that they're in favor, folks are in favor of duplexes, and this is what they're saying, right? Um, so I, I think that, um, I, I hope that that answers your question, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, so you did bring up a very uh, notable point. The fact that this was previously scheduled for February 4th, we're now at the 18th, you're proposing or requesting or asking us to consider a further adjournment. In the interest of fairness and impartiality, uh, would it not be fair to hear the proponent, the developer, uh, before making a decision on whether to adjourn or whether to vote on the matter? No, of course I accept that there is, um, you know, that, that the developer has their own story to tell, right? But obviously that's, that's not for me to do. Um, my, you know, my suggestion here, and, and, and when I get to a point, just, you know, uh, when I get to a point in an appeal where I see that I can't meet some of the criteria, that I have concerns over one or more. I, I do either decide to say no to the project or, you know, I think you can adjourn. What I'm saying here is adjourn. What, what comes off as, on the face of it, three variances that you might not shake your head at. When you bring into the context the area, the problems with the back lane, the history of the file at IRPW all along Pembina. I think it adds to the complexity and the point that the residents are trying to make in the Point Road neighborhood that transit-oriented development wasn't properly considered by the city. The advent of BRT and our investments weren't properly considered. I think if you ask the questions of administration, they will say, yeah, we too thought we should more deeply go into and examine transit-oriented development along corridors that would naturally be created like Jubilee. Mm -hmm. But instead, the Point Road residents, in particular the residents on Jubilee, have just seen these adjustments being made. And they're, they've got these downriver effects now. They can't park in front of their homes, one. Mm -hmm. These are folks that are otherwise proponents of density mm -hmm. and bus rapid transit. And that's why, you know, I, I think it's best to adjourn, regroup, and add that complexity, provide direction that the building height here and the density is not on, that the buffering parking and the parking variances are simply not on because you, like me, believe that this was simply car-oriented development from the beginning that was that was, while you know, understandable from administration's perspective from the perspective of residents and this city councilor was frankly shoehorned in as, 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 as transit oriented development and a modest density. A modest density this is not, and you simply I don't think can argue okay. that Council it's transit oriented. So, so, so if I'm hearing you correctly then, what you're, you, you're stating is, is that in and of itself, the, uh, the variances are not that onerous but given the context of the space that they're considering and the other elements in terms of transit, in terms of the back lane, the snow removal, the garbage bins, the fact that you know the only access is through a private, uh, private business, those are the things that also need to be considered in terms of this development. Yes, please, please consider it's, you know, this is an island and you're, you're creating an entrance through a private business. Um, and it's something that I, you know, will be there to remind you as I do the casework, as I go forward. I already have casework here all along Pembina 
with businesses and sometimes schools and safety issues that I've brought forward at IRPW, this is unique because unlike all of the rest of those streets where you have street back mm -hmm. lane street, this is Jubilee has been rendered something else. And so that pressure on that back lane, the lack of entrances and exits, you're going through Fountain Tire. So really problematic. It, it, it should call into question those densities. It is not modest. These are not light variances. The, this is a residential two family and it should remain as such in my opinion until we do the larger planning. And Councillor Rollins, um, are you also registered to speak for 914 Jubilee? I sure am. So I'm assuming it's the same. I sure am. And it's the same. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions of council colleagues with that robust discussion that we've just undertaken? Seeing none. Th thank you very much. Just a, if the request is um, to defer to a later yeah, date. Speak up if you can, Councillor Allard. We can't no. hear you. Yeah, let me adjust my microphone. I can't hear him. Is that better? Much. Okay. Um, if the request is delayed over, I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, do we move a motion to that effect? Uh, give the, uh, the developer and the community more time to talk? I, I'm open Madam to Clerk, um, such a motion is in order at this time, correct? It's always in order. But that would mean we would not hear from anyone else on the list today, correct? I mean, I'd be okay with that. I've seen, I've seen um, develop, developments get better from layovers like this one. Uh, you never know what uh, what you're going to get until until you try. And um, anyhow, I would uh, I think the request was for a two month layover. Is that was that what it was? Sixty days. And Madam Clerk, I just want to clarify: this committee would come back to the hearing, correct? We would be calling a special meeting. Special meeting as this appeal um, hearing body's time is it? ending at the end of February. That's right, our rotation is done, but we would come back as we, we heard it today. So I would move that and then we can, hopefully the community and the proponent can work it out with the planning department and perhaps uh, 60 days from now, we'll have a very different presentation. So moved. Madam Clerk, is there any other administrative um, any points anything to, yeah, we to need consider. to know? Councillor, to be clear, this is for items five through eight. Uh, yes. Well, it's just five, actually. Well, just five, but we would likely just move a motion for number seven and eight as well. Could I just uh, would Would you mind if we take a five minute recess? Madam We're just going to chair. Could I yes. just take a five minute recess? Would you mind? I just yeah. need to okay. deal with. You. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. I'll be right back. And we're back. Uh, thank you. Uh, after that last presentation, uh, we agreed that we would continue on with uh, our hearing and uh, hear from uh, those that are registered uh, in support of the appeal and, uh, and the proponent. Uh, so we'll continue on with the next presenter. Council Chambers, does that mean my layover motion failed? Um, we didn't vote on it. We should vote on or it. We should vote on it, yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. But, you know, in fairness to those, and I'll just state this, and you may consider how you want to uh, proceed. We, we, we feel that it's fair to, to hear those that have, um, you know, registered in delegation today, as well as to hear from the uh, proponents. Uh, just to get some feedback and then uh, make a decision on whether we want to lay this over. Uh, for me, I want to find out uh, if, you know, we suggested uh, 60 days or what have you. If we're going to look at a layover, is that a sufficient amount of time considering that we're at, we would be asking the proponent to do some additional consultation. They would have to meet with their architects and and designers and all of that uh and would 60 days be enough time so i do want to hear from them as well okay uh, i'll withdraw I'll, I'll withdraw my motion until we hear from the applicant thank you that, that and i think that's that's only fair thank you councillor lard but i think we're going to circle back to exactly where you were yeah later on yeah thank you okay next to speak in support of the appeal is glenn friesen <clears throat> 
Hi, Glenn, you're live with the Appeals Committee and you'll have 10 minutes to speak after you state your name. Just unmute yourself. There we are. Thank you. Uh, I'm Glenn Friesen in the neighborhood, uh, a family of four for 20 years in the neighborhood. Um, so I, I want to raise a lot of it's been raised already, so I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, it's been a long discussion already, and um, uh, I'm I'm not against infill uh, housing, absolutely not. I've got friends that have purchased lots in, in that, and and so I think what this is about uh, it's a question on density, as as Councillor Rollins has talked about. Um, communities are you know the the intention of these of infills is to is to revitalize neighborhoods, knit people back together. And we've had lots of that in the in the Lord Roberts area, Fort Rouge at large, Osborne Village. Um, there's some discrepancies though, often talked about as being, you know, a way to improve affordable housing. I don't think that's always the case because the, the the furnishings and the way they're designed, they're often quite expensive and they have high, or have high rents. So I think that should be uh, a consideration for this particular unit. Um, I, I really have been quiet on a lot of these things, and I think I. Just I want to raise a point. I've become more vocal now because I've been quite annoyed um, with what happened with a, 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 a wonderful family that's moved in on, on Rosedale Avenue but on, in the, about the 600 block. There's a three and a half story development there that really got people's back up. It's not the builder's fault. Um, it didn't, it, it's your fault. It's, it's, counselor, count, it's the city's fault for not really having better guidelines. Since then, there has been a neighborhood survey. I don't think that's been heated in this discussion. So I think I want to raise that. Um, people commented on what we want in infill housing. And so um, take note. And this obviously is the shoehorning is the term was used. This is shoehorning something and um, into a neighborhood that doesn't fit. Um, I don't need to reiterate the, the, the challenges. I think we, you know, we talked about noise complaints, sewage, snow, the height. I mean, I, I have a friend who had to re had to, because of a, a, a build, had to uh, replace all of their, their furnace and their hot water tank because the chimney no longer worked. Uh, it affected airflow. And so is that, I don't know if that's considered, it maybe small in some people's minds, but um, there is an impact on the, on the properties next to it. Regarding parking, you've heard it all. Um, people, I, you know, I've watched the yards develop in the, in, in the corridor, the, the rail corridor there. Um, and uh, people are, you know, thought maybe not to have cars. Well, they all do. And that's just reality. We live in this in Winnipeg, people want a car. So we're gonna have more vehicles and you'll have visitors and, um, or you'll have people come by to pick you up. And so that, I think that's been addressed. Um, the trees, a very big deal in the neighborhood. We don't wanna see those leave. They have lots of eco eco ecological goods and services um, to, that to provide those services to us as a community, provide the look and the feel and the value to the neighborhood, but also you know, the water and uh, shading and et cetera. Um, I mean, I work in climate change for, for the province. I, I get this stuff. So, um, so, the, so the first point was I'm not against infill. I think we have to do it smartly. Second point is this particular one is, has lots of eye poking issues with it and it should be re, that those should be addressed. The third point I want to make is that growth for the sake of growth isn't sustainable. Um, you know, and I think what we what we don't look at here is this can often widen the socioeconomic gap between neighborhoods when you allow this kind of development in some neighborhoods and not others. I don't know what's going on in Riverview, but I'm aware that subdivisions of lots is not permitted, um, and I don't I wouldn't see this complex uh, going up in that neighborhood. And uh, I would I would raise that as a point to be con to, to be investigated because what's that what that's doing is creating a, a further divide in who and, and how who lives in certain areas and demographics etc. And that that's an important point we need to we need to consider here. Um, it's not worth dismissing. And and that's um, the fourth point I want to bring up is dense housing. We have a place of dense housing in the area, and that is in the yards. I think it's been renamed. I'm sorry about that. It's uh, Metro, the yards, there's a few other names for it, but you know where it is. And um, that's the place where you would create dense housing. It's a, it's, it's a, a blank canvas. Um, you go into it knowing what you're, what you're getting into um, and, and not blindsiding a neighbor uh, in, a, in, a, uh, a, you know, in a residential area with smaller homes with a large development. It just doesn't fit. Um, it's not what it's not, I don't think that's the definition of appropriate infill in the area. So in conclusion, I, I, I echo Councillor Rowland's uh, uh, comments, everyone's comments, especially Rowland's and Michelle Hari's about the criticism of the process. 
Um, it's not my job to do the heavy lifting. The administration should have caught this stuff. If, if they don't, then they're, then they're not adequately resourced, trained and or the bylaws don't exist. But this is, this is, a, this is, this is a pretty obvious uh, uh, example of what doesn't fit and what we shouldn't be doing. And I just, I've spent now since 9 a.m. unpaid um, to, to, to stand here and, and talk about this. Well, I shouldn't have to do that. That's your jobs. And, and I, I mean, and so I, I'd, rather, I'd, I'd rather you guys create a system that recognizes what is within scope, what is within reasonability, and then not have to go to appeal. I mean, the developer, they're very important uh, for all kinds of reasons. And, and this, would, this should have been caught some time ago. Um, uh, I think to that end, I also think we should, we should review what substantial adverse effect means. I, obviously the definition of that is pretty broad. So maybe we need to reconsider what that looks like and that would catch um, this sort of development during the early stages, not having some 15 or so residents online talking to you. Um, yeah, duplex. so uh, duplexes, I think that's maybe more appropriate for this with sufficient parking, people will park, they want cars. Um, and uh, if, if, this if this development is approved, then I think the neighbors should be compensated to their satisfaction. And that would be the fair thing to do. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? When you say compensated, what, what are you referring to? Are you talking about financial compensation or what type of compensation are you referring to? I think you would talk to them about that. Uh, but that, I don't, it could be that, it could be other. But really, they're going to want, they will, who's going to buy that property? I wouldn't. I would never live beside, I'd never buy that house. D Benny's house, I'm sorry. I, I just know that's going to be for a certain group of buyers now. You've narrowed the scope of, his, of the value of his property. Uh, who, who would it appeal to? So that's that's an effect. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Seeing none. Next presenter. Next on the list is Jeffrey Ball in support of the appeal. Hi, Jeffrey, you're live with the Appeals Committee and you'll have 10 minutes to present after you state your name. Mr. Ball, are you with us? Well, can you hear us? It's not on the ball. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, should we move to our next presenter? Let's see if we can circle back to Mr. Ball. Yes, we can. Um, next on the list is Kim Unra. Kim, you'll have 10 minutes to address the committee after you state your name. I'm just waiting for your audio to, to connect. Ms. Unra, can you hear us? Okay, we cannot hear you. I wonder if when they do a tally of the words most used in 2020 and 2021, is you've got to unmute your mic. Miss mm -hmm. <laughs> Unra? Social distance. Can you hear us? Blink twice for yes, once for no. She can hear us, but her microphone is having some issues. Hello? Oh, Hi there. Hi. Uh, we're guess I'm having some kind of technical difficulty. It's Jeffrey Ball. Hi, Mr. Oh. Ball. Okay, let's go back to Mr. Ball and then perhaps circle back to Ms. Emma. 
Okay. So, Mr. am I? Can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you, and you have ten minutes to address the committee after you state your name. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Ball, and I live immediately behind the proposed developments. That the criteria for approval says it can, should not create a substantial adverse effect on the amenities, use, safety, convenience uh, for adjoining properties and areas, and it should be compatible in the area which the property is to be situated. As we've all heard, that this is not compatible with our area, so uh, it's also going to create sub substantial adverse effects on our amenities, our use, and our safety, um, like our value of our house will be plunged. That we can discuss about the use of the back lane, that it's a single back lane, and if they put all the trash or and recycling bins beside each other, there's 16 apartments, that's um, 32 bins, each bin's two feet across, each bin has to be a foot apart. That's 96 feet of trash bins every, every day. Oh, sorry, every trash day. And I I don't see how I can pull out into the into the alleyway if they are now in the alley and nobody can get would be able to get by there. It's 100 feet of pure, unless of course people drive onto my property and go around them, which then would create issues for my safety, my convenience and my my use of my facilities, the aesthetics of having all those trash bins and that. And like, as we heard, the alley floods. And so then we talk about the height of the building. It's going to create, like people can watch us in our yard because it's going to be sufficiently tall and our use of our, maybe of just being convenience of being able to enjoy our yard. And then you have the issues of when the people can back out of their properties. But since it's only, they're going to be right up to the edge of the alleyway, it's going to be very hard to turn 90 degrees to get out or into their parking spots. And in fact, when you go down the alleyways where this is available, you often see, like if you go behind uh, Vic's um, thing, you often see the uh, um, alleyway just off of Pemina, you can see that where multiple vehicles have hit the, the, the fence area of the people whose property is in that, that where these people park. So I'd be very concerned for both the, my, my fence, my car, people walking down the alley, and just with the use of that, right? And so it's not compatible. It's not very, would be, I'd be worried about my safety. Um, you take a look at, well, obviously we take a look at the, the character of our neighborhood, you know, they talk, we think of Jubilee, you think of trees, you think about green space, and you would be losing a significant amount of greenery with that, um, that you just, and with the amount of extra size of the building and the rainwater that would be displaced off of those buildings into the storm sewers, which are not adequate as they are, would flood out and stuff like that. So when you talk about respecting the local context and character of the area, I, it fails. That um, you take a look at, um, like, you know, the, the, like even like the whole way of the collaborative planning, it, it's, it's it's not they didn't come up with this idea to be um oh how can we make a, a community uh building they're just looking at how to make the most units on the space as possible that this is not an urban like transit design building because if they did they would have a spot for people to be picked up dropped off you'd have a place to be able to get things dropped and, like delivered but there isn't. There's, in fact, not even enough space for one car per unit. And if these are 1,000-foot square units or 965, you know, that multiple bedrooms with multiple people and not even one car per unit, like that's pretty almost rideshare uh, as it is if you had multiple families living in um, one of these areas. Like, I've lived in apartments that, and, and I've for many years I, I used transit, and when you take a look at it, the, the rapid rail 
or, or rapid transit does not actually go to any grocery stores. It goes to the university, it goes downtown, but grocery stores, not so much. No, you can go and you can wait for uh, Pamina or go down right now. There, You'd have to go pretty much all the way down to near the university to get to a grocery store because, well, the one that's on McGilvery is under redevelopment. And once again, you're looking at Sunday schedules, you're looking at, you know, COVID times, you're looking at a bunch of things along those lines. Um, that, yeah, transit's not necessarily the viable option it kind of was. You take a look at, um, like, so then you would say, well, maybe I'll just get my groceries delivered or I'll, I'll take the bus and I'll take a taxi back. Well, there's no parking, there's no stopping unless you block the whole alleyway in order to do so. And the traffic will go, is already horrendous in the back alleyway. Um, yeah, I, so my, 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 my property will be affected by the, 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 these huge uh, issues. We're not against having um, uh, development in that. In fact, we would welcome it. We'd, we would really love to see a duplex come in there. And we'd love to be able to do that. But unfortunately, I don't think that this developer is interested in developing a duplex. But, well, I guess we'll see. Um, it, as noted before, this is really stressful. We all had to take time off to work for work in order to come do this. We have to learn how to do these things. And why went the, the, the city should have really looked at this and said, hmm, if this building's a story and a half above everything else in this, that, should, that in itself should have been enough to be, well, this is an appropriate thing, because where will that end? If you say that there's a sixplex down here, now we can build two eightplexes. Well, why not in a condominium when the next building gets turned down? Because, you know, it's only a hop, skip, and a jump from that, you know, that what, but I digress. And um, so uh, thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully this will be adjourned or maybe canceled. All right. Okay. Bye. Thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions of my council colleagues? Seeing none, we can move to uh, Mrs. Unruh. Yes. Is, is that correct? That's correct. Kim, I don't see you having audio. Hi, Kim. We can see you, we cannot hear you. It doesn't appear your audio is connected. Oh, there you are. We will ask you to unmute. Hi, Ms. Sandra. <clears throat> no, your, your audio is missing again. One sec. Kim, we're going to ask you to um, leave the meeting and sign back in. That might alleviate the problem. Sorry. Okay, next we'll go to Leona Gaznowski. Hi, Good Lisa. afternoon. Hi. You'll have I should. Sorry. Go ahead. You're live with the Appeals Committee and you have 10 minutes to address. Thank you. Should, should I preface this with, can you see me? Can you hear me? <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay. Hi, my name is Leona Gosnowski and I live at 920 Jubilee. My family of three has lived here for over 17 years. We've done many renovations to the house and yard, investing a great deal of our time and money. We've established great friendships with our neighbors and I love my neighborhood. For the record, I'm not against infill housing. If it is sensitively 
or sensitive contextually to existing neighborhoods. The applicant seeks to build a four level multifamily apartment building that requires a conditional use permit. I'm strongly opposed to this because I do not feel it meets section 247 sub three of the city of Winnipeg charter. Uh, it is not consistent with Plan Winnipeg, also known as our Winnipeg 2011. Uh, the proper, or the proposed building is 16 units, four levels, over 42 feet to the tip of the roof. Their footprint is over 2,100 square feet. The average existing home in this community is two levels and 1,200 square feet. These two buildings tower over every other home in the neighborhood and are monstrous in comparison. The proposed building will not add to this mature community in a context sensitive manner that is consistent with the direction established for mature communities as identified in the complete communities direction strategy. Our Winnipeg states, complete communities are places that offer and support a variety of lifestyle choices, providing opportunities for people of all ages and abilities. It also states in complete communities uh, that encourages age-friendly and accessible new development in existing neighborhoods. Not one of these 16 units are designed for use by the elderly or persons with disabilities. There are 18 steps up to the front entrance, no elevator for the four floors. And since there's no stopping in front on Jubilee, there is no access to handy transit. The two handy accessible parking stalls, I believe, are for optics only. First, it's not an accessible building. Secondly, they're located on the very far outside edges of the parking area, and they're abutting fencing, and they are actually the farthest from the rear entrance. Uh, as far as planning of the building, the front entrance. A previous design showed the main entrance facing the rear. This shows that being near a rapid transit corridor was not important, nor even a consideration in the planning of this building. This, this building is not accessible to Jubilee except by foot. Now we all know that due to extreme weather, Winnipeg is a car reliant community. Servicing, the applicant received feedback from Solid Waste Division and will be opting for private garbage and recycling service services in order to maximize parking space, minimize variance. It speaks loudly to the fact that our very own city services recognizes they themselves cannot service the tight spaces, nor the output of garbage and recycling from this location. As far as the conditional use, the south side of Pembina, uh, pardon me, the south side of Jubilee Avenue from Pembina Highway to Riverside Drive is zoned R2, residential two-family district, which allows two-family uses as of right. The majority of homes are single-family and two-family in this area. There was a dangerous precedent established by building one three-unit multifamily building located at 896 Jubilee one five-unit multifamily dwelling at 902 Jubilee and one six-unit dwelling approved in 2018 at 868 Jubilee. The number of units at each new dwelling keeps on creeping up. Several residents at these multiplexes have even signed our letter of support, uh, letter in support of appeal recognizing that the new buildings would be too much for the area. The Urban Planning Division may support multifamily residential development in the R2 zone, provided the applicant proposes a context sensitive design, which they have not. The proposal claims that the yards will provide for good sun penetration into neighbors' yards. However, there has been no evidence to substantiate this claim. There's no shadow impact study documented to illustrate how the proposed uh, developments shadow will impact shadow sensitive areas such as neighboring streets, adjacent properties, nearby open spaces and the public realm. Public consultation, they did not canvas more than 10 houses. Uh, they did come door to door. The developer failed to indicate the scope and size of the building. I personally was told they're cleaning up the property and building a couple nice homes like down the street. Um, some neighbors were actually told it would be duplexes. As far as the 10 uh, addresses they've listed in their uh, report for public consultation, of those 10, 
they could not reach three and they did indicated that seven were in support. Uh, of those seven in support, there were six people who actually submitted an appeal or letter in support of appeal. We reached out to the same 10 addresses as the developer and nine out of those 10 houses were not in support. In addition, we, laymen, managed to, during the coldest snap in the year and during times of COVID, we managed to cover far more ground that they even attempted to cover. And you saw by Mr. Gosnowski's map, all the red was not in favor. Uh, at the virtual open house that they held on February 4th, well, that was after the original uh, appeal date. So again, optics only, no previous planning to do that at all. Um, the car share agreement. The division has also included a condition of approval, approval on this variance to ensure a formalized agreement is provided by the city for the car share vehicle prior to building permits being issued. At this time, the contract is in principle only. The location is not within the current car share service area. The vehicle would be located in the back lane and not in a location neither safe nor visible to the public. And that is one of the car share requirements. So to summarize, they're putting 16 dwellings where there was previously four. The building is not context sensitive to the existing homes and neighborhood. The building was never intended as a link to the rapid transit corridor since the original design did not even consider locating the front entrance facing Jubilee. It was an afterthought. Waste and recycling removal cannot even be supported by our own city of Winnipeg Solid Waste Division. There's been no mention of snow removal at all in the plans, which is a huge issue. The back lane cannot accommodate the land drainage. There's no stopping on Jubilee from Pembina to Riverside. Volume of vehicular traffic should be located on collector and on local streets and not into the back lane. The only vehicular entrance and exit to the lots is via the back lane. The only access for ta taxis, delivery vehicles, etc., is only via the back lane. There's no provision for safe and efficient vehicular access, egress, and circulation. They cannot minimize parking aesthetics and spillover impacts on adjacent public streets and private properties. They cannot ensure adequate on-site parking to discourage the potential for off-site parking spillover onto adjacent public streets. There has been no anticipated plan of improvement in an already overburdened and crumbling back lane. Winnipeg's population is aging and expected to reach 17.6% by 2030. This building is not ensuring the needs of older Winnipegs. It's not endorsing age in place. Uh, and of course, there's all the negative environmental impacts due to the intens intensification on the lot. There's the increase in air pollution. There's the increase in noise pollution. There is, where are they going to put their 16 air conditioner units? Negative impact on residents for all the reasons above. Even just the safety of, of any families there that have children running into the back lane, not, not no bueno, as it was once said. Um, I, in context of section 20, 247 sub three, the urban planning division should not approve the conduct, conditional use for the following reasons. A, it's not consistent with Plan Winnipeg and any applicable secondary plan in that the produced, pardon me, the proposed conditional use does not meet the requirement to enable context sensitive infill development in a mature community as envisioned in the complete communities direction strategy in that the proposed conditional use does not meet requirements to encourage age-friendly and accessible new development in existing neighborhoods as envisioned in our Winnipeg, living in an age-friendly city. And it does not, or pardon me, it does create a substantial adverse effect on the amenities, use, safety, and convenience of the adjoining, adjoining property in adjacent areas, including an area separate, separated from the property by a street or waterway in that, the proposed multifamily apartment housing does not meet our two zoning standards. Hello. Uh, yes. You, yeah. Hang on one second. Uh, how much time do you have left? Or I how, have a two under two minutes. Under two I'll, minutes. I'll move in. Yes. Mr. Chair, two minutes. All in favor? 
Aye. All those carry. Go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so that the multifamily, it's, it's in an R2 zoning and that the variances requested are not minor to the neighbors and the neighborhood as it states. Clearly from Michelle, who was upset, you can tell it's not minor to her. There we had one neighbor who has lived in this area for over 15 year, 50 years, five zero years. She said she'd move. So it is absolutely not minor to her. The height variance request is not in context. The parking variance requesting six spots instead of, of 10 is a safety hazard. There's no provision for safe and efficient vehicular access and circulation. The parking various variance asking for no guest space will have spillover impacts. And it is not compatible in the area in which the property is, is uh, situated. Um, uh, so in conclusion, our Winnipeg complete communities, community says it best, in order to achieve quality design on a consistent basis, the city will develop an urban design strategy, which will help to foster a sense of place with unique neighborhood character, recognizing that there is a place for everything and everything has its place. They say it best, a place for everything and everything has its place. I ask, please do not cram two multifamily 16 unit apartment buildings into my neighborhood. This is not the place. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, hopefully we can now go back to Mrs. Unruh, who we could probably hear and uh, she can hear us. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, bravo. Awesome. Okay. My apologies. Good afternoon. I'm Kim Nina Patolsky Unraw. Good afternoon, councillors, public service members, and fellow neighbors in the in attendance. I reside at 903 Merriam Boulevard. Now this is adjacent 868 Jubilee. I've been in the neighborhood for over 30 years, and I'm here to express my disagreement to the number of aspects that people have cited so far on this eight unit family dwelling at 912 and 914. To provide background on my opposition, it is back in 2018 in October, I was at City Hall. I was attending a hearing on the development of this six unit dwelling located at 868 Jubilee, along with my other neighbors. Unfortunately, in December, 2018, when the appeal appeal hearing was scheduled, I could not attend in person due to my job commitment and no other opportunity or accessibility to attend. So with that, I'm thankful today to do this virtual. In saying this, I wanna to speak to my experience with the development of 868 Jubilee and the adverse effect it's had on our mature community neighborhood. To start during the development of this, complex. Um, the developer presented the plans to the city and since has not followed those plans. The developer poured asphalt onto neighboring private properties without consent, hence taking up the green space that was absorbing the moisture, where now the neighbors on either side are in complaint of water in their garages. The other item is one of those neighbors, sadly, of 27 years, my dearest neighbor ever, has now moved away. She moved away last year. And in that, as well, they wanted initially nine parking spots. Ended up being they could only fit six. In saying this, some of those pictures that you saw with the double parking, this is what I experience every day behind my garage. You can cite 311 with the numerous phone calls uh, with respect to tradespeople blocking my entry and exit. I have a double long garage, so I'm coming in and going out on the other end. They're blocking both sides. And uh, so there's lots of complaints. And if you look at 311 in the database, you'll see the numerous issues with 868 Jubilee. Finally, um, they were to put up a fence according to the plan. This never happened. I'm looking at two fence posts. 
Well, I, I kind of understand why with the six spots, if they all parked accordingly, the driver on the far left couldn't open the door if a fence was up and the driver and the, and the passenger on the far right of the parking parking lot couldn't open their door if a fence was there. So they didn't put up the fence. In, in, instead, they put 12 recycle bins on either side of private property without consent again. And um, garbage day happens. There are a dozen bins scattered everywhere. Because they're double parking in the six spots that are now 12, the bins are in behind the vehicles and hence there have been times where I've seen uh, vehicles stop, oh, get out oh, and talking. move vehicles. So um, well, again, nice. I've experienced the development. Don't get me wrong, I'm totally for building development, but in a, in a situation where we have duplexes and I live in an R1 zone, not an R2 zone, and the traffic, my property runs the back lane of Riverside Drive. The traffic up and down since that development has been crazy. I actually reached out to Sherry's office, Councillor Roland, Roland's office, and I got these please slow down signs. I've got them on the front of Merriam. I've got them on the side of the Riverside Lane. Totally not, uh, not, not acknowledged. Um, so with saying this, the other thing was they really touted the fact that this development was going to utilize the rapid transit and, and the bicycle paths. Well, I have to say, I've been here watching this for two years, not one bicycle parked in that rack all summer long for the last two years. I can't agree that these people are actually citing transit when they have 14 vehicles back there. Now, the last piece I wanna to speak to is just on January 13th, I wrote a letter to Councillor Rollins because the owner who, con who hired a contractor to remove the snow from the six parking spots um, didn't end up trucking the snow away, but put it up against my fence. I have snow almost to the lattice of my fence, which is a six foot fence. And everyone else has a foot. Even the neighbor beside me said, how do you have so much snow? And I said, well, I guess I'm the lucky one. And as well, my adjoining neighbor on Riverside Drive also got a nice pile of snow against their fence and broke their fence. So this is the north side of my property. It's the last to melt. My fence endures water like there's no tomorrow for at least four months. And now I'm left to hire a contractor to remove this snow from my fence. I did make a complaint to 311, it's on record. So in saying this, these are my experiences with a six unit complex. I love the neighbors, don't get me wrong but I don't like the traffic. I don't like the snow removal situation. And I don't like the, uh, the blocking of my, when people come to pick people up, they park in front of my garage. So in saying all of this, I'm totally opposed to this. And I believe we fulfilled the density issue here. So in saying that, I, I support Bernie's cause here as I've lived it, and I just wanted to say that. Thank you for your time. My apologies for the unmuting. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mrs. Onra. You don't have to apologize. Take it up with Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> uh, are there any questions uh, of my council colleagues? Seeing none. Next on the list is Jean Altmeyer. Hi, Jean. Hello. Hi, you're live with the Appeals Committee and you'll have up to 10 minutes to state your presentation. 
Hi, my name is Jean Oldmeyer. Um, I am in opposition to the variance being applied for at 912, 914 Jubilee. I want to express my support for the folks who have come before me because they have been eloquent, shared their lived experience and their knowledge. My focus will be a bit different. Um, Jubilee has already seen a destructive infill development, which some people referred to earlier, out of scale um, to the streetscape and resulted in the removal of many mature trees to be replaced front to back, side to side with buildings. With few or no replacement of the trees that were taken down, and the few that have been planted, it will be decades before they provide anything close to uh, what a mature tree does. Please note mature trees provide carbon capture, flood and sewer mitigation, erosion prevention, enhanced air quality and energy savings. And various of the residents have referred to those being crucial uh, to that particular part of Jubilee. At the present rate that we're losing our tree canopy, half of Winnipeg's 3 million trees may be gone in 20 years due to disease, infestation, extreme weather, and destruction by construction. These two lots under consideration for overdevelopment currently contain three oaks that probably took over a hundred years to grow. Two of them are on the east side of 912 Jubilee and measure 20 inches and 22 inches in diameter. There's one healthy elm at the front of the property of 912 and it measures 22 inches diameter. There's a healthy oak at the back lane, which is about 16 inches and one healthy spruce along the west side of 914. It's about 20 inches uh, trunk diameter. As well, there are quite a few Manitoba maples between the properties as well as along the front. And they are younger, um, but they range in size from eight to 18 inches. So they've been there a while and they do provide the resources that mature tree do. As well, there are established shrubs along the sidewalk, which help screen those properties from the traffic. The mature trees on both neighboring lots, which the neighbors have referred to, likely will be damaged by the construction of such large units due to root disturbance, soil compacting, damage to the bark by large machines, et cetera. The city's infill guidelines need to include protection of mature trees. Perhaps anything over eight inches would be considered mature. As part of those guidelines, the city should assign an asset value to trees. They should impose fees for tree removal and require replanting, protection, replacement, of new trees on infill lots. It is useful to ponder why various areas are high demand, places like Kingston Row, Crescentwood, Riverview, and others. It's because when those houses were built, mature trees were retained. The developers recognized the advantages of that. The city needs to reestablish that as a norm as part of its efforts to protect and sustain our urban canopy. As well, the developer should do his research. Trees on private property are excellent investments for the homeowners and the developers as they increase property value. The presence of larger trees in yards and street trees can add from three to 15% to home value. A comprehensive study on urban forests in four cities in Florida 
showed that property values increased by 1,586 US dollars per tree on average. Conserving trees during development provides return to those developers. It's a win-win for the developer to keep all the beautiful trees. It will make the property that much more valuable. Any additional development costs would be offset by higher prices that can be charged and faster sales. I thank the Trees Please Coalition and the South Osborne community for their research and years of advocacy to protect and preserve distinctive neighborhoods. I ask that this variance be denied and that the proponent rework his plan to reduce the size of these buildings and their impact on the area and on the natural assets. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions of my council colleagues? Seeing none, next presenter. Next on the list is Quinn Gaznowski. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Hi. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you're live with the appeals committee and you have up to 10 minutes to state your presentation after you state your name. Oh, perfect. Okay, well, my name is Quinlan Gasnowski, and I don't have a speech prepared, but I just, I just want to support everything that my neighbors have said. They've all fairly covered all of our concerns, and I personally went door to door with a mask on in minus 40 weather talking to everyone, and everyone is just in agreement of, of all of these concerns and, and issues and the fact that, you know, they've been here for so long and it's just not what our neighborhood needs and it's not what our neighborhood's about, right? Um, having that many people in, in such a little space where it's just a, a sore thumb in, in and amongst all of the other duplexes, right? And so I, I just, I support all of my neighbors and against of this being built. Thank you. This is that the totality of your presentation? Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, keeping it brief <laughs> and to the point. Yeah, I know we've been here for a while, so. <laughs> Are there any questions of my council colleagues? Seeing none, next presenter. Next registered in support, but is not speaking is Evan Amado. Um, that's the end of our list for those in support. Mr. Okay. Chair, we'll move to those. Uh, to the applicant, Vitaly Ishin, okay. in opposition. Okay, so if we can move to the applicant. Hang on a second, just trying to get the, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi Vitaly, you're live with the appeals committee and you'll have up to 10 minutes to state your presentation. Okay, um, so I just wanted to say the how this whole process started is when this land became available for sale, uh, we contacted the, the city planners department to see what's, uh, what's possible to do on the lot. And uh, we've gone through several, uh, several designs uh, to uh, accommodate the neighborhood and what's allowed within the guidelines of the R2 and conditional zoning or conditional use uh, parameters. So, and uh, we've, yeah, we worked pretty diligently with the planners on this. We uh, checked with the water and waste as well to make sure that there's capacity. Uh, we checked with uh, uh, the engineers as well to address the issues of uh, drainage and uh, how the, that's going to have the uh, low impact on my, the surrounding neighbors as well. And uh, yeah, we've come to, some, uh, to a design that we thought would fit uh, well within the neighborhood. And uh, probably been working with the with the planners for about three to four months on that before we actually presented something uh, to the neighbors. So I just wanted to address the fact that um, there's been, it's been said that uh, when we when we canvassed the neighborhood, we said that the, there's going to be only two, uh, or we're going to put up some uh, duplexes. That's not the case. I went around with the actual plans and the elevations and the side plans. And uh, yes, I did reach out to our canvas canvas 10 houses, uh, as was uh, stated correctly. It was hard to get a hold of people. I went several times and uh, 
the people that I did get a hold of uh, and that I spoke to, I uh, did say that there's going to be something similar to what was built down the street, which was a sixplex with an additional story on top of it. And I did show the, uh, the renderings and I did show the side plans. Um, also, uh, on top of that, I left uh, some people who were fine with just uh, looking at it uh, as is and they didn't want me to leave the brochure. Uh, I did leave uh, the brochure with the residents of 920 Jubilee and uh, that brochure had my phone number on there. It also had the phone number of the designers on there as well. And uh, in the two and a half months or over two and a half months between uh, the time that I went out at the end of September and the time that uh, the posters were posted for the variances and the conditional use, we haven't heard anything. And uh, at the door, I did say that uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, so that was my uh, side of the story on that. Um, also, uh, we did have another uh, uh, virtual hearing that uh, we've also uh, organized for February 4th after we learned about the appeal because we wanted to give the opportunity to, um, to provide more information and discuss a lot of these uh, issues that have, uh, have surfaced as with respect to parking, snow clearance and whatnot. So with respect to parking, I understand the concern that uh, the other development down the street uh, has people uh, double parking. In this case, that won't even be possible because the, the stalls are 23 feet long. So you can only park one vehicle there. With respect to a private collection, um, we've spoken to a, a private collection com uh, company, which is Waste Management. And um, we've, we've made it clear to them that when, when garbage bins are collected, they need to be put back right out there because uh, our concern is for the uh, residents around us, the, the people off the back lane, uh, whether they are on Jubilee or on the adjacent street, as well as uh, the residents of the proposed buildings. We want to make sure that people aren't having to move garbage bins around uh, in order to access uh, their parking stalls. So that was clear and that that was the agreement. So uh, when we're arranging for private collection, uh, the company would come, they would pick it up, uh, get rid of the garbage once a week, uh, just like the city of Winnipeg would. And then afterwards they would place the, uh, the bins back where uh, they belong. As far as snow clearing, definitely understand the concern of the residents uh, around as well. So what we would do in this case is once again, it ties into access to our site as well and for the residents of uh, our proposed buildings is we would want to make sure that the snow is cleared and doesn't pee on the back lane or other neighbors. There's plenty of uh, space on the, uh, the backyard uh, for the snow to be stored uh, temporarily or permanently, whatever uh, the agreement would be made with a snow clearing company. But uh, the intention there is to not put any uh, snow onto the back lane or against the fence of other neighbors. And uh, yeah, once again, the idea here is to provide a good quality of living for future uh, tenants uh, because it is a great neighborhood with a lot of uh, amenities and we want to make sure that the, we're providing an opportunity for people to enjoy nice a nice space uh, within the neighborhood without having to purchase a home because not everybody can purchase a home and some people's lifestyles don't fit uh, the idea of carrying a mortgage and they would want to just rent and I, I know one of the uh, things that was brought up is that uh, you know it's not necessarily for uh, the elderly, but uh, this this neighborhood would be well suited for uh, younger uh, generation as well, due to its proximity to universities and the rapid transit, and uh, the fact that uh, a lot of those people don't own cars, but do feel that uh, the rapid transit would be a huge uh, advantage to them. And also on top of that, um, a lot of the residents that uh, would be younger, they would be using uh, bicycle storage as well. And uh, when it comes to when it comes to visitors, well, I mean that's a that's kind of a that's a I guess a situation by situation uh, type of scenario. And we understand that uh, there's adjacent streets. Uh, maybe a lot of people take uh, Uber uh, nowadays, but it's a you know we're looking for a certain type of demographic uh, that is going to be aware of the restrictions of the building we're not necessarily going to uh, be able to fill this building within the first 
month just because it has just because for the reasons that it doesn't have sufficient parking for uh, for every single uh, person. So in this case, uh, we feel that uh, if we carefully vet the tenants that are coming into the buildings, uh, they'll be the types of tenants that uh, the parking and the amenities will be well suited for them. And uh, we don't anticipate having any issues for the building as well as the surrounding neighbors. Um, and as far as, uh, I guess, I think I'm kind of trying to keep it brief here. Uh, And as far as the car co-op, I've actually, while we're having this meeting, I got an email from the car co-op as well, uh, saying that they've heard about the, this appeal and uh, if they need anything else uh, for support, uh, they'll be able to provide that as well. So some of those points that were mentioned before that uh, the car uh, the car co-op uh, wouldn't be in support of this, I have an email that came in within the last hour uh, that uh, they would be in support of this as well. So once again, I feel that that would be a benefit uh, to the neighborhood as well for some people that don't own vehicles or don't have a second vehicle that they could uh, take advantage of an on-site vehicle uh, and uh, be able to have transportation around the city. So I'd say that'd be, that'd be it on my part. Okay, are, are there, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, are there any uh, questions of my council colleagues? Councilor okay. Sharma. Uh, Mr. Ishan, there was a, a thought earlier about adjourning this hearing to a date in the future. If we were to do that, uh, how much time do you feel you have to work through uh, improving the project with our city planning department and also the residents? Would you need a month or two or two and a half? Uh, I wouldn't need that long, no. Um, a month would be the most I would need. Uh, if we went that route, I mean, I hope that uh, we're not going that route, but if we went that route, I, I would need a month at most. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, may I ask a question of our public service at this time, or would that be later? Uh, could you respond to the time frame that you may need? Uh, Is the microphone on? I just want to point out that uh, with our uh, public service administrative report deadlines, uh, Typically our reports need to be um, completed about a month ahead uh, of the hearing date, whether that be appeals or any other hearing. So um, we just with that in mind, it may need a little bit more than a month uh, if, there's if there's consultation and new architectural plans being drafted as a result. Thank you. So just to restate Mr. Right. Vision, the city requires a, a few weeks, three to four weeks to prepare our reports because they go through different channels. Um, so that would be added on to any time you may need. Yeah, and the other part of it too, is there any, so conservatively speaking then, if we looked at say a two month process, do you have any dates in May that would be amenable to this uh, process? I would need a recess yeah. council chambers to determine what dates we're gonna need help with. Sure. Mr. Chair, I'd just like to suggest any further questions for the applicant. And maybe then we can take a recess because as we all know, if we do um, suggest a adjournment and require a special meeting, we need to gain some approvals here okay. uh, to have a special meeting during this pandemic period. Are there any other questions of uh, council colleagues that are on Zoom? No? I mean, for myself, I'm hoping that uh, we don't do an adjournment just because like I said, we've done- uh, uh, Mr. Chair, just course. the rules of order, please. Yeah. Yeah. No, you've had your 10 minutes and this oh, is a... right. yeah, well, yeah, well, nobody's asked them a question. So I think he was out of order and that's why I was raising that. Yeah. Well, I'd like to, if I may, then I'll ask a question, Mr. Sure. Chair. Uh, we asked you what time you may need and um, are, do you feel that you can work in collaboration a little further with the city planning department and the residents to come up with maybe Maybe it'll be the similar product, maybe a bit different. Are you willing to do some of that work or do you felt, feel it's all been done? I feel, well, I feel that we've done our part uh, and 
we really hope that there is no need for adjournment. Um, having said that, uh, we wanna make sure that the project uh, goes ahead um, and I'll uh, let maybe uh, Matthew from uh, Winthrop and Associates kind of speak to that as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, can we uh, have a quick uh, five minute recess? Should we move a motion maybe for that? Recess? Yeah. Yeah. What's up? Councillor Allard, did you wanna move that motion? Uh, well, I did, but I thought that the clerk needed uh, five minutes to consult yeah. the schedule. Five minutes. Okay, but I guess to give some direction, is that what she's consulting for? Well, yeah, so I'd like to move that uh, that we move uh, adjournment, but I would like to the clerk to propose some dates. If that's and I understand correct. the clerk needs five minutes to that effect. Correct. Or 10. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, five or 10? Five, five minutes. Five, okay, thank you. Okay. So we'll recess for five then. And we are back. <laughs> Um, so, do we have a motion? Councillor Allard, I, I understand you were prepared to move something. My apologies, I was trying to find the right window. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah, I move that the applicant reach out to the residents who registered for the appeal hearing on February 18th, 2021 to allow for community consultation, which will consist of one, reaching out to the registered residents from the February 18, 2021 appeal hearing for meaningful dialogue, two, facilitate with the assistance or to the satisfaction of the Director Planning Property and Development Department for online communication via Zoom, MS Teams, or any alternative virtual platform, but not limited to three, Site plans for the subject properties to be provided for discussion in order to receive input from the community with results to be presented at the April 22, 2021 appeal hearing. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Just to confirm, you're, you're, you're laying this over then till the April 22nd at 1 p.m. at the at City Hall. Right, thank you, Council Brawati, I'm moving that as well. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, just before I, and, and this is related to both 912 and 914 uh, Jubilee, uh, so that we can dispense with both of these today and move them to uh, April 22nd at 1 p.m. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Oh, sorry. No, Go no. Ahead. Opposed? Carried. Madam Clerk, I wanted to make sure we were in order uh, moving an omnibus like that, or should we? You are. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'll move adjournment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, carried, we're out. Just sorry, before we leave for everybody in the waiting room, I will send out um, communication of the direction that was moved today by the appeal committee for your information and hopefully answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair.